Part three, chapter ten of Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part three, chapter ten. A strong team. I would not wish to offend the self regard of Vermilionville, but what a place in which to seek enlargement of life i know worth and greatness have sometimes not to say oft times emerged from much worse spots from little lazy villages noisy only on sunday with grimier courthouses deeper dust and mud their trade more entirely in the hands of rat-faced isaacs and jacobs with more frequent huge and solitary swine slowly scavenging about in abysmal self-occupation fewer vine-clad cottages raggeder negroes and more decay vermilionville is not the worst at all i have seen large and enlarging lives there hither came the two st pierres no claude said they would not go to the beausoleil house privately he would make himself believe he had not returned to anything named beausoleil but only and simply to vermilionville on a corner opposite the public square there was another hotel and it was no great matter to them if it was mostly pine boards pale wallpaper and transferable whitewash but not to be outdone by its rival round the corner it had besides a piano of a quality you may guess and a landlady's daughter who seven times a day played and sang i want to be somebody's darling and had no want beyond the travellers turned thence found a third house full conjectured the same of the only remaining one and took their way after all towards zosephine's it was quite right now to go there thought claude since destiny led and so he let it lead both his own steps and the thrumping boots of this dear figure in campeachy hat and soft untrimmed beard that followed ever at his side and then after all looking into those quiet black eyes of zosephine's to hear that marguerite was not there gone gone to the great city the place too big to live in gone there for knowledge training cultivation larger life and finer uses gone to study an art an art risen beyond him like a diamond in the sky and he fool enough to come rambling back blue-shirted and brown-handed expecting to find her still a tavern maid so farewell fantasy twas better so much better now life was simplified oh yes and st pierre made matters better still by saying to zosephine i didn't know you got one little gal claude never tell me about dat i spec dat why he don't want come yere he don't like gal he run from em like dog from yellow jacket he don't like none of em what he like das his daddy he just married to his daddy the father dropped his hand smilingly upon his son's shoulder with a weight that would have crushed it in had it been ordinary cast iron. Claude took the hand and held it, while Zosephine smiled and secretly thanked God her child was away. In her letters to Marguerite she made no haste to mention the young man's reappearance, and presently a small thing occurred that made it well that she had left it untold with claude and his father some days passed unemployed yet both felt them to be heavy with significance the weight and pressure of new and to them large conditions were putting their inmost quality to proof claude saw now what he could not see before why his friend the engineer had cast him loose without a word of advice as to where he should go or what he should do it was because by asking no advice he had really proposed to be his own master and now could he do it dare he try it the first step he took was taken i suppose instinctively rather than intelligently certainly it was perilous he retreated into himself 
St. Pierre found work afield, for of this sort there was plenty. The husbandman's year and the herder's too were just gathering good momentum. But Claude now stood looking on empty handed, where other men were busy with agricultural utensils or machines, or now kept his room whittling out a toy miniature of some apparatus which when made was not like the one he had seen at last a great distress began to fill the father's mind there had been a time when he could be idle and whittle but that time was gone by that was at grand point and now for his son for claude to become a lounger in tavern quarters Claude had not announced himself to Vermilionville as a surveyor or as anything. Claude, to be a hater of honest labor, was this what Bonaventure called civilization? Better, surely better, go back to the old pastoral life. How yearningly it was calling them to its fragrant bosom. And almost everything was answering the call. The town was tricking out its neglected decay with great trailing robes of roses. The spade and hoe were busy in front flower beds and rear kitchen gardens. Lanes were green, skies blue, roads good. In the bas fond, the oaks of many kinds and the tupelo gums were hiding all their gray in shimmering green. In these coverts and in the reedy marshes, all the feathered flocks not gone away north were broken into nesting pairs. In the fields crops were springing almost at the sower's heels. On the prairie pastures, once so vast, now being narrowed so rapidly by the people's thrift, the flocks and herds ate eagerly of the bright new grass, and foals, calves, and lambs stood and staggered on their first legs, while in the dooryards housewives, hens, and mother geese warned away the puppies and children from downy broods under the shade of the china trees. But Claude? Even his books lay unstudied, and his instruments gathered dust, while he pottered over two or three little wooden things that a boy could not play with without breaking. At last St. Pierre could bear it no longer. "'Well, Claude, das ten days and runnin' now. "'We ain't do nothin' but whittlin'.' "'Claude slowly pushed his model from him, "'looked as one in a dream into his father's face, "'and suddenly, and for the first time, "'saw what that father had suffered for a fortnight. "'But into his own face there came no distress, "'only for a moment a look of tender protestation, "'and then strong hope and confidence.' "'Yes,' he said, rising, "'dat's true, but we don't got whittle no more.' He pointed to the model, then threw his strong arms akimbo and asked, "'You know what is dat?' "'No,' nah, replied the father, "'I dunno. I tink tain't no real machine, "'cause I don't never see nothing like dat at Belle Alliance Plantation, "'neither at Belmont, and I know, me, "'if anybody got one machine any place for do anything more better or more quicker,' Mr. Wallis and Monsieur le Bourgeois, they bound to have him. Can't hitch nothing to dat ting you got there. She too small for a rat. What is she, Claude? A yet stronger hope and courage lighted Claude's face. He laid one hand upon the table before him and the other upon the shoulder of his sitting companion. Papa, if you want to go with me to de city, we make one big enough for two mule. Das a machine, a new machine, my machine, my invention. Invinch? What dat is, invinch? Someone knocked on the door. Claude lifted the model, moved on tiptoe, and placed it softly under the bed. As he rose and turned again with reddened face, a card was slipped under the door. He took it and read in a pencil scrawl, State Superintendent of Public Education, looked at his father with a broad grin, and opened the door. Mr. Tarbox had come at the right moment. There was a good hour and a half of the afternoon still left, and he and Claude took a walk together. 
Beyond a stile and a frail bridge that spanned a gully at one end of the town, a noble avenue of oaks leads toward Vermilion River. On one side of this avenue the town has since begun to spread, but at that time there were only wide fields on the right hand and on the left. At the farther end, a turn almost at right angles to the left takes you through a great gate and across the railway, then along a ruined hedge of roses, and presently into the oak grove of the old ex-governor's homestead. This was their walk. By the time they reached the stile, Claude had learned that his friend was at the head of his line, and yet had determined to abandon that line for another, far up the height, Excelsior. Also that his friend had liked him, had watched him, would need him, and was willing then and there to assure him a modest salary, whose amount he specified, simply to do whatever he might call upon him to do in his, Claude's, line. They were walking slowly, and now and then slower still, as they entered the avenue of the oaks, Claude declined the offer. Then they went very slowly indeed. Claude learned that Mr. Tarbox, by some chance not explained, had been in company with his friend the engineer, that the engineer had said, Tarbox, you're a born contractor, and that Claude and he would make a strong team, that Mr. Tarbox's favorite study was human nature, that he knew talent when he saw it, had studied Claude, had fully expected him to decline to be his employee, and liked him the better for so doing. That was just a kind of test vote, see? Then Mr. Tarbox offered Claude a partnership, not an equal one, but withal a fair interest. We've got to commence small and branch out gradually, see? And Claude saw. Now you wonder why I don't go in alone. Well, I'll tell you, and when I tell you, I'll astonish you. I lack education. Now, Claude, I'm taking you into my confidence. You've done nothing but go to school and study for about six years. I had a different kind of father from yours. I never got one solid year's schooling all told in my life. I've picked up cords of information, but an ounce of education's worth a ton of information. Don't you believe that, eh? It is so. I say it, and I'm the author of the A of UI. I like to call it that because it brings you and I so near together, see? The speaker smiled, was still, and resumed. That's why I need you, and I'm just as sure you need me. I need not only the education you have now, but what you're getting every day. When you see me, you see a man who is always looking away ahead. I see what you're going to be, and I'm making this offer to the Claude St. Pierre of the future. Mr. Tarbox waited for a reply. The avenue had been passed, the railway crossed, and the hedge skirted. They loitered slowly into the governor's grove, under whose canopy the beams of the late afternoon sun were striking and glancing but all their light seemed hardly as much as that which danced in the blue eyes of Mr. Tarbox, while Claude slowly said, "'I don't know if we can fix dat. I was glad to see you comin'. I reckon you just right kind of man I want. I just make a new invention. I tink if you find dat's good, dat be contract enough for right smart while. And beside, I tink I invent some more before long.' But Mr. Tarbox was not rash. He only asked quiet and careful questions for some time. The long sunset was sending its last rays across the grove-dotted land, and the birds in every tree were filling the air with their sunset song-burst when the two friends re-entered the avenue of oaks. They had agreed to join their fortunes. Now their talk drifted upon other subjects. "'I came back to Vermilionville purposely to see you,' said Mr. Tarbox. "'But I'll tell you privately, you wasn't the only cause of my coming.' "'Claude looked at him suddenly. "'Was this another haunted man? 
Were there two men haunted and only one fantasy? He felt ill at ease. Mr. Tarbox saw, but seemed not to understand. He thought it best to speak plainly. I'm courting her, Claude, and I think I'm going to get her. Claude stopped short, with jaws set and a bad look in his eye. Get who? But Mr. Tarbox was calm, even complacent. He pushed his silk hat from his forehead and said, One made up of loveliness alone, a woman of her gentle sex the seeming paragon. I refer to the Rose of Vermilionville, the Pearl of the Parish, the loveliest love and fairest fair that ever wore the shining name of Beausoleil. She's got to change it to Tarbox, Claude. Before yon sun has run its course again, I'm going to ask her for the second time. I've just begun asking, Claude. I'm going to keep it up till she says yes. She's not yonder, snarled Claude, with a frown and growl of a mastiff. She's gone to de city. Mr. Tarbox gazed a moment in blank amazement. Then he slowly lifted his hat from his head, expanded his eyes, drew a long groan, turned slowly half around, let the inhalation go in a long keen whistle, and cried, "'Oh, taste, taste, who's got the taste? What do you take me for? Who are you talking about? That little monkey? Why, man alive, it's the mother I'm after. Ha, ha, ha!' If Claude said anything in reply, I cannot imagine what it was. Mr. Tarbox had a right to his opinion and taste, if taste it could be called, and Claude was helpless to resent it, even in words. But for hours afterward he execrated his offender's stupidity, little guessing that Mr. Tarbox, in a neighboring chamber, alone and in his night-robe, was bending, smiting his thigh in silent merriment and whispering to himself, "'He thinks I'm an ass! He thinks I'm an ass! He can't see that I was simply investigating him!' End of Part 3 Chapter 10「Part three, Chapter eleven of Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part three, Chapter eleven. He asks her again. Claude and his father left the next day, Saturday. Only the author of the A of U.I. knew whither they were gone. As they were going, he said very privately to Claude, I'll be with you day after tomorrow. You can't be ready for me before then, and you and your father can take Sunday to look around and kind of see the city. But don't go into the downtown part. You'll not like it. Nothing but narrow streets and old buildings with histories to them, and gardens hid away inside of them, and damp archways and pagan-looking females who can't talk English, peeping out over balconies that offer to drop down on you and then don't keep their word. Everything old-timey and Frenchy and Spanishy, unprogressive. You wouldn't like it. Go uptown. That's American. It's new and fresh. There you'll find beautiful mansions, mostly frame, it's true, but made to look like stone, you know. There you'll see wealth. There you'll get the broad daylight, the merry, merry sunshine that makes the heart so gay. See? Yes, and Monday we'll meet at Jones's, 17 Chupatula Street. All right, I'll be on hand, but today and tomorrow, Alabama, here I rest. I feel constrained, he laid his hand upon his heart, closed one eye, and whispered, to stay. I would fain spend the Sabbath in sweet Vermilionville. You get my idea? The Sabbath afternoon, beyond the town where Mr. Tarbox strolled, was lovelier than can be told. Yet he was troubled. Zosephine had not thus far given him a moment alone. I suppose when a hundred generations more have succeeded us on the earth, 
Lovers will still be blind to the fact that women do not do things our way. How can they? That would be capitulation at once, and even we should find the whole business as stupid as shooting barnyard fowls. Sosephine had walked out earlier than Tarbox. He had seen her go, but dared not follow. He read, Thou shalt not, as plain as print on her back as she walked quietly away, that same little peremptory back that once in her father's calèche used to hold itself stiff when Tanaz rode up behind. The occasional townsman that lifted his slouch hat in deep deference to her silent bow did not read unusual care on her fair brow, yet she too was troubled. Marguerite, she was the trouble. Sosephine knew her child could never come back to these old surroundings and be content. The mother was not willing she should. She looked at a photograph that her daughter had lately sent her. What a change from the child that had left her! It was like the change from a leaf to a flower. There was but one thing to do, follow her. So Zosephine had resolved to sell the inn. She was gone now to talk with the old ex-governor about finding a purchaser. Her route was not by the avenue of oaks, but around by a northern and then eastern circuit. She knew Mr. Tarbox must have seen her go, had a genuine fear that he would guess whither she was bound, and yet deeper down in her heart than woman ever let soliloquy go, was willing he should, for she had another trouble. We shall come to that presently. Her suitor walked in the avenue of oaks. She's gone, he reckoned to himself, to consult the governor about something, and she'll come back this way. He loitered out across fields, but not too far off or out of sight, and by and by there she came, with just the slightest haste in her walk. She received him with kindly reserve, and they went more slowly together. She told where she had been, and that the governor had approved a decision she had made. "'Yes, I go and sell my hotel.' "'He's right,' exclaimed her companion with joy. "'And you're right.' "'Well, tain't sold yet,' she responded. She did not smile as she looked at him. He read trouble, some trouble apart from the subject, in her quiet, intense eyes. "'You know somebody want buy dat?' she asked. "'I'll find someone,' he promptly replied. Then they talked a little about the proper price for it, and then were very still until Mr. Tarbox said, "'I walked out here hoping to meet you.' Madame Beausoleil looked slightly startled, and then bowed gravely. "'Yes, I want your advice. It's only business, but it's important, and it's a point where a woman's instinct is better than a man's judgment.' There was some melancholy satire in her responding smile, but it passed away, and Mr. Tarbox went on. You never liked my line of business. Zosephine interrupted with kind resentment. Ah! No, I know you didn't. You're one of the few women whose subscription I've sought in vain. Till then I loved my business. I've never loved it since. I've decided to sell out and quit. I'm going into another business, one that you'll admire. I don't say anything about the man going into it. Honor and shame from no condition rise. Act well your part. There all the honor lies. But I want your advice about the party I think of going in with. It's Claude St. Pierre. Zosephine turned upon the speaker a look of steady penetration. He met it with a glance of perfect confiding. She sees me, he said at the same time, far within himself. It was as natural to Mr. Tarbox to spin a web as it is for a spider. To maneuver was the profoundest instinct of his unprofound nature. Zosephine felt the slender threads weaving around her, but in her heart of hearts there was a certain pleasure in being snared. It could not to her seem wholly bad for Tarbox to play spider, provided he should play the harmless spider. 
Mr. Tarbox spoke again, and she listened amiably. Claude is talented. He has what I haven't. I have what he hasn't. And together we could make each other's fortune, if he's only the square, high-style fellow I think he is. I'm a student of human nature, and I think I've made him out. I think he'll do to tie to. But will he? You can tell me. You read people by instinct. I ask you just as a matter of business advice and in business confidence. What do you think? Will you trust me and tell me, as my one only trusted friend, freely and fully, as I would tell you? Madame Beausoleil felt the odds against her, but she looked into her companion's face with bright, frank eyes and said, Yes, I think yes, I think tis so. Thanks, said her friend with unnecessary fervor and tenderness. Then Claude will be my partner, unless... My dear friend, shall you be so kind, I might almost say confiding, to me, and me not tell you something I think you'd ought to know? For I hope we are always to be friends, don't you? Yes, she said very sadly and sweetly. Thanks, and if Claude and I become partners, that will naturally bring him into our circle, as it were, see? The little madame looked up with a sudden austere exaltation of frame and intensity of face, but her companion rushed on with, And I'm going to tell you, let the risk to me be what it may, that it may result in great unhappiness to Claude, for he loves your daughter, who I know you must think too good for him. Madame Beausoleil blushed as though she herself were Marguerite and Tarbox were Claude. Ah, love, Marguerite, na, no, na, no. he don't love nobody but his papa, his papa tell me dat. Ah, oh, na, no, tis not so. Mr. Tarbox stopped still, and when Zosephine saw they were in the shadow of the trees, while all about them was brightened by the momentary southern twilight, she too stopped, and he spoke. What brought Claude back here when by right he should have gone straight to the city? You might have guessed it when you saw him. He paused to let her resolve the thought, and added in his own mind, If you had disliked the idea, you'd have suspected him quick enough, and was pleased. He spoke again. But I didn't stop with guessing. Zosephine looked up to his face from the little foot that edgewise was writing nothings in the dust. No, continued her companion, I walked with him two evenings ago in this avenue, and right where we stand now, without his ever knowing it, then or now, he as good as told me. Yes, Josephine, he dares to love your beautiful and accomplished daughter. The thought may offend you, but— was I not right to tell you? She nodded and began to move slowly on, he following. I'm not betraying anyone's confidence, persisted he, and I can't help but have a care for you. Not that you need it, or anybody's. You can take care of yourself if any man or woman can. Every time your foot touches the ground, it says so as plain as words. That's what first caught my fancy. You haven't got to have somebody to take care of you. Oh, Josephine, that's just why I want to take care of you so bad. I can take care of myself, and I used to like to do it. I was just that selfish and small. But love's widened me. I can take care of myself, but, oh, what satisfaction is there in it? Is there any? Now I ask you. It may do for you, for you're worth taking care of but I want to take care of something I needn't be ashamed to love. He softly stole her hand as they went. She let it stay, yet looked away from him, up through the darkling branches, and distressfully shook her head. Don't, Josephine, don't do that. I want you to take care of me. You could do better, I know, if love wasn't the count, but when it comes to loving you, I'm the addition to looks. I know you've an aspiring nature, but so have I. 
and I believe with you to love and you loving me and counseling and guiding me, I could climb high. Oh, Josephine, it isn't this poor tar-box I'm asking you to give yourself to. It's the tar-box that is to be. It's the coming tar-box. Why, it's even a good business move. If it wasn't, I wouldn't say a word. You know I can and will take the very best care of everything you've got and I know you'll take the same of mine. It's a good move every way. Why, here's everything just fixed for it. Listen to the mockingbird. See him yonder just at the right of the stile, see? Oh, Josephine, don't you see he isn't still singing where the weeping willow waves? He's on the myrtle, the myrtle, Josephine, and the crape myrtle at that. Widowhood unwidowed. Now he's on the fence, but he'll not stay there, and you mustn't either. The suitor smiled at his own ludicrousness, yet for all that looked beseechingly in earnest. He stood still again, continuing to hold her hand. She stole a furtive glance here and there for possible spectators. He smiled again. You don't see anybody. The world waves its claim but there was such distress in her face that his smile passed away, and he made a new effort to accommodate his suit to her mood. "'Josephine, there's no eye on us except it's overhead. Tell me this. If he that was yours until ten years ago was looking down now and could speak to us, don't you believe he'd say yes?' "'Oh, I don't know. Not today. Not this day.' The widow's eyes met his gaze of tender inquiry and then sank to the ground. She shook her head mournfully. No, no, not dis day. Tis to-day Tanaz was kill. Mr. Tarbox relaxed his grasp and Zosephine's hand escaped. She never had betrayed to him so much distress as filled her face now. De man what kill him get away. You think I get merry while dat man alive? Ho! Oh. "'You think I let Marguerite see me do dat? Ah, uh, no. Nah. She waved him away and turned to leave the spot, but he pressed after, and she paused once more. A new possibility lighted his eyes. He said eagerly, "'Describe the man to me. Describe him. How tall was he? How old would he be now? Did they try to catch him? Did you hear me talking yesterday about a man? Is there any picture of him?' "'Have you got one? Yes, you have. It's in your pocket now with your hand on it. Let me see it.' "'Ah, uh, I didn't want you to see that. No, I don't suppose, as far as you know yourself, you did.' He received it from her, and with his eyes still on her, continued, "'No, but you knew that if I got a ghost of a chance I'd see you alone. You knew what I'd ask you.' "'Yes, you did, Josephine, and you put this thing into your pocket to make it easier to say no.' "'Ha! Easier! Ha! Easier! I need something to help me do that? Ha! Tis not so!' But the weakness of the wordy denial was itself almost a confession. They moved on. A few steps brought them into better light. Mr. Tarbox looked at the picture. Zosephine saw a slight flash of recognition. He handed it back in silence, and they walked on, saying not a word until they reached the stile. But there, putting his foot upon it to bar the way, he said, "'Josephine, the devil never bid so high for me before in his life as he's bidding for me now. And there's only one thing in the way. He's bid too late.' Her eyes flashed with injured resentment. Ah, you, you don't know nothing. But he interrupted. Stop, I don't mean more than just what I say. Six years ago, six and a half, I met a man of a kind I'd never met to know it before. You know who I mean, don't you? Bonaventure? Yes, that meeting made a turning point in my life. You've told me that whatever is best in you, you owe to him. Well, knowing him as I do, I can believe it. And if it's true, then it's the same with me. For first he, and then you, have made another man out of me. Ah, oh, no, Bonaventure maybe, but not me. Ah, oh, no. 
But I tell you, yes, you, Josephine. I'm poor sort enough yet, but I could have done things once that I can't do now. There was a time when if some miserable outlaw stood, or even seemed, maybe, to stand between me and my chances for happiness, I could have handed him over to human justice, so-called, as easy as wink. But now? No, never any more. Josephine, I know that man whose picture I've just looked at. I could see you avenged. I could lay my hands and the hands of the law on him inside of twenty-four hours. You say you can't marry till the law has laid its penalties on him, or at least while he lives and escapes them. Is that right? Zosephine had set her face to oppose his words only with unyielding silence, but the answer escaped her. Yes, tis so, tis right. No, Josephine, I know you feel as if it were, but you don't think so. No, you don't. I know you better in this matter than you know yourself and you don't think it's right. You know justice belongs to the state, and that when you talk to yourself about what you owe to justice, it means something else that you're too sweet and good to give the right name to and still want it. You don't want it. You don't want revenge. And here's the proof. For Josephine, you know and I know that if I, even without speaking, with no more than one look of the eye, should offer to buy your favor at that price, even ever so lawfully, you'd thank me for one minute and then loathe me to the end of your days. Zosephine's face had lost its hardness. It was drawn with distress. With a gesture of repulsion and pain, she exclaimed, I didn't mean, I didn't mean, ah! Uh, what, private revenge? No, of course you didn't, but what else would it be? Oh, Josephine, don't I know you didn't mean it? Didn't I tell you so? But I want you to go farther. I want you to put away forever the feeling. I want to move and stand between you and it, and say, whatever it costs me to say it, God forbid. I do say it. I say it now. I can't say more. I can't say less. And somehow... I don't know how, wherever you learned it, I've learned it from you. Sosephine opened her lips to refuse, but they closed and tightened upon each other. Her narrowed eyes sent short flashes out upon his, and her breath came and went long and deep without sound. But at his last word she saw, the strangest thing, to be where she saw it, a tear, tears standing in his eyes saw them a moment and then could see them no more for her own her lips relaxed her form drooped she lifted her face to reply but her mouth twitched she could not speak i'm not so foolish as i look he said trying to smile away his emotion if the state chooses to hunt him out and put him to trial and punishment i don't say i'd stand in the way that's the state's business. That's for the public safety. But it's too late. You and Bonnyventure have made it too late for me to help anyone, least of all the one I love, to be revenged. He saw his words were prevailing and followed them up. Oh, you don't need it any more than you really want it, Josephine. You mustn't ever look toward it again. I throw myself and my love across the path. Don't walk over us. Take my hand. Give me yours. Come another way. And if you'll let such a poor excuse for a teacher and guide help you, I'll help you all I can to learn to say, Forgive us our trespasses. You can begin now by forgiving me. I may have thrown away my last chance with you, but I can't help it. It's my love that spoke. And if I have spoiled all, and if I've got to pay for the tears you're shedding with the greatest disappointment of my life, still I've had the glory and the sanctification of loving you. If I must say, I can say, tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Must I? Are you going to make me say that? Sosephine, still in tears, silently and with drooping head, pushed her way across the stile and left him standing on the other side. 
he sent one pleading word after her. Isn't it most too late to go the rest of the way alone? She turned, lifted her eyes to his for an instant, and nodded. In a twinkling he was at her side. She glanced at him again and said quite contentedly, Yes, tis so, and they went the short remnant of the way together. End of Part 3, Chapter 11「Part Three, Chapter Twelve of Bonaventure, a Prose Pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a Prose Pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part Three, Chapter Twelve The Beausoleils and St. Pierre's. You think of going to New Orleans in the spring. Certainly the spring is the time to go. When you find yourself there, go some day for luncheon, if they haven't moved it, there is talk of that, go to the Christian Women's Exchange, already mentioned, in the Rue Bourbon, French Quarter. You step immediately from the sidewalk into the former drawing-room of a house built early in the century as a fashionable residence. That at least is its aspect. Notice, for instance, in the back parlor, crowded now like the front one with eating tables, a really interesting old wooden mantelpiece. Of course, this is not the way persons used to go in old times. They entered by the porte cochere and open carriageway upon which these drawing rooms still open by several glass doors on your right. Step out there. You find a veranda crowded with neat white clothed tables. Before some late alterations, there was a great trellis full of green sunshine and broken breezes, entangled among vines of trumpet creeper and the scuppernon grape. Here you will be waited on by small blue calico robed damsels of Methodist unsophistication and Presbyterian propriety to excellent refreshment. Only, if you know your soul's true interest, eschew their fresh bread and insist on having yesterday's. However, that is a matter of taste there, and no matter at all here. All I need to add is that there are good apartments overhead to be rented to women too good for this world, and that in the latter end of April 1884, Zosephine and Marguerite Beausoleil here made their home. The tavern was sold, the old life was left far behind. They had done that dreadful thing that everybody deprecates and everybody likes to do, left the country and come to live in the city. And Zosephine was well pleased. A man who had tried and failed to be a merchant in the city, he and his wife took the tavern, so Zosephine had not reduced the rural population had not sinned against statistics. Besides, she had the good conscience of having fled from Mr. Tarbox, put you and I apart, as it were, and yet without being so hid but a suitor's proper persistency could find her. Just now he was far away prosecuting the commercial interests of Claude's one or two inventions, but he was having great success. He wrote once or twice, but got no reply, and hoped to be back within a month. When Marguerite, after her mother's receipt of each of these letters, thought she saw a cloud on her brow, Zosephine explained, with a revival of that old look of sweet self-command which the daughter so loved to see, that they contained matters of business not at all to be called troubles. But the little mother did not show the letters. She could not. Marguerite did not even know their writer had changed his business. As to Claude, his name was never mentioned. Each supposed the other was ignorant that he was in the city, and because he was never mentioned, each one knew the other was thinking of him. Ah, Claude, what are you thinking of? Has not your new partner in business told you they are here? No, not a word of it. "'That'll keep till I get back,' Mr. Tarbox had said to himself, and such shrewdness was probably not so ungenerous after all. 
"'If you want a thing done well, do it yourself,' he said one evening to a man who could not make out what he was driving at. And later Mr. Tarbox added to himself, "'The man that flies the kite must hold the thread.' And so he kept his counsel. But that does not explain, for we remember that Claude already knew that Marguerite was in the city, at least had her own mother's word for it. Here weeks had passed. New Orleans is not so large. Its active center is very small. Even by accident on the street, Canal Street especially, he should have seen her time and again. And he did not, at any rate not to know it. She really kept very busy indoors, and in other doors so did he. More than that, there was his father. When the two first came to the city, Saint-Pierre endured the town for a week, but it was martyrdom doing it. Claude saw this. Mr. Tarbox was with him the latter part of the week. He saw it. He gave his suggestive mind to it for one night. The next day Saint-Pierre and he wandered off in streetcars and on foot, and by the time the sun went down again a new provision had been made. At about ninety minutes' jaunt from the city's centre, up the river and on its farther shore, near where the old company canal runs from a lock in the river bank, back through the swamps and into the Baratarian lakes, Saint-Pierre had bought with his lifetime savings a neat house and fair-size orangery. No fields? None. You see, bon by, by and by, Claude get dose new machine in. He go to engineer in again, and him and you, Tarbox, be taken some contract for Bill Levy, or break up old steamboat, or raise something what been sunk, or something that way, and then he certain want somebody to boss gang of fellows, and then he say, Papa, I want you, and then I say how I got fifty arpent, forty acres, rice in field, and then he say, how I going do without you? And then there be fifty arpent rice gone. No, no fields. Better. Here with the vast wet forest at his back, the river at his feet, the canal, the key to all Barataria, La Fourche, and Terbonne, full of Acadian fishermen, hunters, timber cutters, moss gatherers, and the like, the great city in sight from yonder neighbor's balustraded housetop, and Claude there to rally to his side, or he to Claude's, at a moment's warning. He would be an operator, think of that, not of the telegraph, an operator in the wild products of the swamp, the prairie tremblante, the lakes, and the small harvests of the points and bayou margins, moss saw logs venison wild duck fish crabs shrimp melons garlic oranges perique tobacco knowledge is power he knew wood water and sky by heart spoke two languages could read and write and understood the ways and tastes of two or three odd sorts of lowly humankind self-command is dominion I do not say the bottle went never to his lips, but it never was lifted high. And now to the blessed maxim gotten from Bonaventure he added one given him by Tarbox, in union is strength. Not mere union of hands alone, but of counsels. There were Claude and Tarbox and he. For instance, at Mr. Tarbox's suggestion, Claude brought to his father from the city every evening, now the Picayune and now the Times Democrat. From European and national news he modestly turned aside. Whether he read the book notices I do not know. I hope not. But when he had served supper, he was a capital camp cook, and he and Claude had eaten, and their pipes were lighted, you should have seen him scanning the latest quotations and debating the fluctuations of the moss market, the shrimp market, and the garlic market. Thus Claude was rarely in the city save in the busy hours of the day. Much oftener than otherwise he saw the crimson sunsets, 
and the cool purple sunrises as he and st pierre pulled in the father's skiff diagonally to or fro across the mississippi between their cottage and the sleepy outposts of city street cars just under the levee at the edge of that green oak-dotted plain where a certain man as gentle shy and unworldly as our engineer friend thought claude to be was raising the vast buildings of the next year's universal exposition. But all this explains only why Claude did not, to his knowledge, see Marguerite by accident. Yet by intention, why not by intention? First there was his fear of sinning against his father's love. That alone might have failed to hold him back. But second, there was his helplessness. Love made Tarbox, if anything were needed to make him, grave. It made Claude a coward. And third, there was that helpless terror of society in general, of which we have heard his friend talk. I have seen a strong horse sink trembling to the earth at the beating of an empty drum. Claude looked with amazed despair at a man's ability to overtake a pretty girl acquaintance in Canal Street, and walk and talk with her. He often asked himself how he had ever been a moment at his ease those November evenings in the tavern's back parlor at Vermilionville. It was because he had a task there. Sociality was not the business of the hour. And now I have something else to confess about Claude, something mortifying in the extreme, for you see the poverty of all these explanations. Their very multitude makes them weak. Many fires cannot quench love. What was the real matter? I will tell. Claude's love was a deep sentiment. He had never allowed it to assert itself as a passion. The most he would allow it to be was a yearning. It was scarcely personal. While he was with Marguerite in the inn, his diffidence alone was enough to hide from him the impression she was making on his heart. In all their intercourse he had scarcely twice looked her full in the face. Afterwards she had simply become in memory the exponent of an ideal. He found himself often now asking himself, Why are my eyes always looking for her? Should I actually know her were I to see her on this sidewalk or in this street car? And while still asking himself these silent questions, what does he do one day but fall, to all intents and purposes at least, fall in love, pell-mell, up to the eyebrows, with another girl? Do you remember Uncle Remus's story of Br'er Rabbit with a bucket of honey inverted on him? It was the same way with Claude. He want des only bedauble wid it, he was des kivered. It happened thus. An artist friend whose studio was in Carondelet Street, just off of Canal, had rented to him for a workroom a little loft above the studio. It had one window looking out over roofs and chimney-pots upon the western sky, and another down into the studio itself. It is right to say friend, although there was no acquaintanceship until it grew out of this arrangement. The artist, a single man, was much Claude's senior, but Claude's taste for design, love of work, and the artist's grave sincerity, simplicity, and cordiality of character, he was a Spaniard with a Spaniard's perfect courtesy, made a mutual regard, which only a common diffidence prevented from running into comradeship. One Saturday afternoon, Claude, thirsting for outdoor air, left his airy for a short turn in Canal Street. The matinee audiences were just out, and the wide, balcony-shaded sidewalks were crowded with young faces and bright attires. Claude was crossing the neutral ground toward Bourbon Street, when he saw coming out of Bourbon Street a young man, who might be a Creole, and two young girls in light and what seemed to him extremely beautiful dresses, especially that of the farther one, who, as the three turned with buoyant step into Canal Street to their left, showed for an instant the profile of her face and then only her back. 
Claude's heart beat consciously, and he hurried to lessen the distance between them. He had seen no more than the profile, but for the moment in which he saw it, it seemed to be none other than the face of Marguerite. End of Part 3, Chapter 12「Part Three, Chapter Thirteen of Bonaventure, a Prose Pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a Prose Pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part Three, Chapter Thirteen, The Chase. Claude came on close behind. No, now he could see his mistake, it was not she, but he could not regret it. This was Marguerite repeated, yet transcended. The stature was just perceptibly superior. The breadth and grace of these shoulders were better than Marguerite's. The hair, arranged differently and far more effectively than he had ever seen it on Marguerite's head, seemed even more luxurious than hers. There was altogether a finer dignity in this one's carriage than in that of the little maid of the inn. And see now, now, as she turns her head to glance into this shop window, it is and it isn't, it isn't and it is, and... No, no, it is not Marguerite. It is like her in profile, singularly like, yet far beyond her the nose a little too fine, and a certain sad firmness about the mouth and eyes, as well as he could see in the profile, but profiles are so deceptive, that he had never seen in Marguerite. But how do I know? What do I know? he asked himself, still following on. The Marguerite I know is but a thing of my dreams, and this is not that Marguerite of my actual sight, to whom I never gave a word or smile or glance that calls for redemption. This is the Marguerite of my dreams. Claude was still following when, without any cause that one could see, the young man of the group looked back. He had an unpleasant face. It showed a small offensive energy that seemed to assert simply him and all his against you and all yours. His eyes were black, piercing, and hostile. They darted their glances straight into Claude's. Guilty Claude, dogging the steps of ladies on the street. He blushed for shame, turned a corner into Exchange Alley, walked a little way down it, came back, saw the great crowd coming and going, vehicles of all sorts hurrying here and there, ranks of street-cars waiting their turns to start to all points of the compass, sellers of peanuts and walking-sticks, buyers of bouquets, acquaintances meeting or overtaking one another, nodding bonnets, lifted hats, faces, 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 but the one face was gone. Caught, Claude, and by a mere face? The charge is too unkind. Young folly, yes, or old folly, may read goodness rashly into all beauty, or not care to read it in any. But it need not be so. Upon the face of youth the soul within writes its confessions and promises. And when the warm pulses of young nature are sanctified by upward yearnings and pure conscience, the soul that seeks its mate will seek that face which, behind and through all excellencies of mere tint and feature, mirrors back the seeker's own faiths and hopes, and when that is found, that to such a one is beauty. Judge not. You never saw this face fairer than Marguerite's, to say whether its beauty was mere face or the transparent shrine of an equal nobility within. Besides, Claude would have fired up and denied the first word of the charge with unpleasant flatness. To be caught means to be in love. To be in love implies a wish and hope to marry. And these were just what Claude could not allow. 
May not a man, nevertheless, have an ideal of truth and beauty, and look worshipfully upon its embodiment? Humph! His eyes sought her in vain, not only on that afternoon, but on many following. The sun was setting every day later and later, through the black lacework of pecan trees and behind low dark curtains of orange groves, yet he began to be more and more tardy each succeeding day in meeting his father under the riverside oaks of the exposition grounds. And then, on the seventh day, he saw her again. Now he was more confident than ever that this vision and he, except in dreams, had never spoken to each other. Yet the likeness was wonderful. But so, too, was the unlikeness. True, this time she only flashed across his sight, out of a bank, into a carriage where a very American-looking lady sat waiting for her, and was gone. But the bank, the carriage, that lady, those earlier companions. No, this could not be Marguerite. Marguerite would have been with her mother. Now if one could see Madame Beausoleil's daughter with Madame Beausoleil at her side, to identify her and distinguish her from this flashing and vanishing apparition, it would clear away a trying perplexity. Why not be bold and call upon them where they are dwelling? But where? Their names were not in the directory. Now, inventive talent, do your best. Well, said St-Pierre after a long silence, Claude and he were out on the swollen Mississippi, pulling with steady leisure for the homeside shore, their skiff pointed half to and half from the boiling current. The sun was gone, a purple dusk wrapped either low bank, a steamboat that had passed upstream was now, at the turning of the bend, only a cluster of soft red lights. Venus began to make a faint silvery pathway across the waters. St. Pierre had the forward seat at Claude's back. The father looked with fond perplexity at the strong young shoulders swinging silently with his own, forward and backward, in slow monotonous strokes and said again well what's matter look like cat got your tongue make a new machine then in a low dissatisfied tone i reckon something mighty curious he repeated the last three words in the acadian speech check shows bien curieux yes replied the son mighty strange i tell you when we come at home he told all recounted all his heart's longings, all his dreams, every least pang of self-reproach, the idealization of Marguerite, and the finding of that ideal incarnated in one who was and yet seemed not to be, or rather seemed to be and yet was not, Marguerite. And then he went on to reassure his father that this could never mean marriage, never mean the father's supplanting, a man could worship what he could never hope to possess. He would rather worship this than win such kind as he would dare woo. He said all these things in a very quiet way, with now and then a silent pause, and now and then a calm, self-contained tone in resuming. Yet his sentences were often disconnected, and often were half soliloquy. Such were the only betrayals of emotion on either side until Claude began to treat, in the words just given, his father's own heart interests. Then the father's eyes stood brimming full. But St. Pierre did not speak. From the first he had listened in silence, and he offered no interruption, until at length Claude came to that part about the object of his regard being so far, so utterly beyond his reach. Then— Stop! That's all foolishness! You want her? You can have her! Ah, oh, papa, you don't understand what I am! Ah, bah, what anybody is, what she is! She invented bigger machine than you, a more better corn stubble destroyer and plant corner. He meant corn planter. 
She invent a more handier double-action pea-vine rake? What she done make her so grand? No, sir, she look fine in de face, yas, and dat's all you know. Well, dat's all right, dat's de Cajun way. Pick em out by face. You begin Cajun way, for why you don't finish Cajun way? All you got to do, you get good saddle hoss and ride. Bom by you see her. You ride behind her till you find where her daddy livin' at, then you ride past yonder every day till four five days, and then you see de old man come scrape friend with you. Then he has you drop round, and first thing you know, adieu la college. Claude did not dispute the point, though he hardly thought this case could be worked that way. He returned in silent thought to the question, how to find Madame Beausoleil. He tried the mail, no response. He thought of advertising, but that would never do. Imagine, if Madame Beausoleil, late of Vermilionville, will leave her address at this office, she will hear of something not in the least to her advantage. He couldn't advertise. It was midday following the eve of his confession to his father. For the last eleven or twelve days, ever since he had seen that blessed apparition turn with the two young friends into Canal Street out of Bourbon, he had been venturing daily for luncheon just down into Bourbon Street to the Christian Women's Exchange. Now by all the laws of fortune he should in that time have seen in there at least once or twice a day already the face he was ever looking for. But he had not nor did he to-day. He only saw, or thought he saw, the cashier, I should say the cashieress, glance crosswise at him with eyes that seemed to him to say, Fool, sneak, whelp, Cajun, our private detectives are watching you. Both rooms and the veranda were full of ladies and gentlemen whose faces he dared not lift his eyes to look into, and yet even in that frame there suddenly came to him one of those happy thoughts that are supposed to be the inspirations of inventive genius. A pleasant little female voice near him said, "'And apartments upstairs that they rent to ladies only.' and instantly the thought came that Marguerite and her mother might be living there. One more lump of bread, a final gulp of coffee, a short search for the waiter's check, and he stands at the cashieress's desk. She makes change without looking at him or ceasing to tell a small hunchbacked spinster standing by about somebody's wedding. But suddenly she starts. Oh, wasn't that right? You gave me four bits, didn't you? And I gave you back two bits and a picayune, and... Sir, does Madame who? Oh, yes, I didn't understand you. I'm a little deaf on this side. Scarlet fever when I was a little girl. I'm not the regular cashier. She's gone to attend the wedding of a lady friend. Just wait a minute, please, while I make change for these ladies. Oh, dear, ma'am, is that the smallest you've got? I don't believe I can change that, ma'am. Yes. No. Stop. Yes, I can. No, I can't. Let's see. Yes. Yes. Yes, I can. I've got it. Yes, there. I didn't think I had it. She turned again to Claude with sisterly confidence. Excuse me for keeping you waiting. Haven't I met you at the YMCA sociable? Well, you must excuse me, but I was sure I had. Of course I didn't if you was never there, but you know in a big city like this you're always meeting somebody that's nearly somebody else that you know. Oh, didn't you ask me? Oh, yes, Madame Beausoleil. Yes, she lives here, she and her daughter, but she's not in. Oh, I'm sorry, neither of them is here. She's not in the city, hasn't been for two weeks. They're coming back. We're expecting them every day. She heard of the death of a relative down in Terrebonne somewhere. I wish they would come back. We miss them here. I judge they're relatives of yours, if I don't mistake the resemblance. You seem to take after the daughter. Wait a minute. Someone coming up to pay looked at Claude to see what the daughter was like, and the young man slipped away, out blushing the night sky when the marshes are afire. The question was settled 
settled the wrong way. He hurried on across Canal Street. Marguerite had not been, as he had construed the inaccurate statement, in the city for two weeks. Resemblances need delude him no longer. He went on into Carondelet Street, and was drawing near the door and stairway leading to his friend's studio and his own little workroom above it, when suddenly from that very stairway and door issued she whom, alas, he might now no longer mistake for Marguerite, yet who, none the less, for lessening hope, held him captive. End of Part 3 Chapter 13Part Three, Chapters Fourteen and Fifteen of Bonaventure, a Prose Pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a Prose Pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part Three, Chapter Fourteen Who She Was. For a moment, somewhat more than her profile shone upon Claude's bewildered gaze. "'I shall see her eye to eye at last,' shouted his heart within. But the next moment she turned away, and with two companions, who came across the same threshold, moved up the street, and at the nearest corner vanished. Her companions were the American lady and the artist. Claude wheeled and hurried to pass around the square in the opposite direction, and as he reached the middle of its third side, saw the artist hand them into the street car, lift his hat, and return towards the studio. The two men met at the foot of the stairs. The Spaniard's countenance betrayed a restrained elation. "'You go and see a picture now,' he said, in a modestly triumphant tone. "'Come in,' he added, as Claude would have passed the studio door. They went in together. The Spaniard talked. Claude scarcely spoke. I cannot repeat the conversation literally, but the facts are these. A few evenings before, the artist had been one of the guests at a musical party given by a lady whose name he did not mention. He happened, he modestly believed it accidental, to be seated beside the hostess when a young lady, Jung Creole Lathy, he called her, who was spending a few days with her, played the violin. The Spaniard's delicate propriety left her also nameless, but he explained that, as he understood, she was from the Teche. She played charmingly, for an amateur, he qualified, but what had struck him more than the music was her beauty, her figure, her picturesque grace. And when he confessed his delight in these, his hostess, seemingly on the inspiration of the moment, said, "'Paint her picture. Paint her just so. I'll give you the order. Not a mere portrait. A picture.' And he had agreed, and the Jung lady had consented. The two had but just now left the studio. Tomorrow a servant would bring violin, music rack, etc., the ladies would follow, and then— "'You hear music, anyhow,' said the artist. That was his gentle way of intimating that Claude was not invited to be a looker-on. On the next day, Claude in his nook above, with the studio below shut from view by the curtain of his inner window, heard the ladies come. He knows they are these two, for one voice, the elder— blooms out at once in a gay abundance of words, and the other speaks in soft, low tones that, before they reach his ear, run indistinguishably together. Soon there comes the sound of tuning the violin, while the older voice is still heard praising one thing and another, and asking careless questions. I suppose that cotton cloth covers something that is to have a public unveiling some day, doesn't it? Claude cannot hear the answer. The painter drops his voice even below its usual quiet tone. 
But Claude knows what he must be saying, that the cloth covers merely a portrait he is finishing of a young man who has sat for it to please a wifeless and, but for him, childless and fondly devoted father. And now he can tell by the masculine step and the lady's one or two lively words that the artist has drawn away the covering from his, Claude's, own portrait. But the lady's young companion goes on tuning her instrument, tink, 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 and now the bow is drawn. "'Why, how singular!' exclaims the elder lady. "'Why, my dear, come here and see. Somebody has got your eyes. Why, he's got your whole state of mind, a reduplication of it. And I declare he looks almost as good as you do. If I—' The voice stops short. There is a moment's silence in which the unseen hearer doubts not the artist is making signs that yonder window and curtain are all that hide the picture's original, and the voice says again, "'I wish you'd paint my picture,' and the violin sounds once more its experimental notes. But there are other things which Claude can neither hear nor see nor guess. He cannot see that the elder lady is already wondering at, and guardedly watching, an agitation betrayed by the younger, in a tremor of the hand that fumbles with her music-sheets and music-stand, in the foot that trembles on the floor, in the reddened cheek and in the bitten lip. He may guess that the painter sits at his easel with kindling eye, but he cannot guess that just as the elder lady is about to say, "'My dear, if you don't feel,' the tremor vanishes, the lips gently set, and only the color remains. But he hears the first soft moan of the tense string under the bow, and a second, and another, and then, as he rests his elbows upon the table before him, and covers his face in his trembling hands, it seems to him as if his own lost heart had entered into that vibrant medium, and is pouring thence to heaven and her ear its prayer of love. Paint, artist, paint, let your brushes fly. None can promise you she shall ever look quite like this again. Catch the lines the waving masses and dark coils of that loose-bound hair, the poise of head and neck, the eloquent sway of the form, the folds of garment that no longer hide but are illumined by the plenitude of an inner life and grace, the elastic feet, the ethereal energy and discipline of arms and shoulders, the supple wrists, the very fingers quivering on the strings, the rapt face, and the love-inspired eyes. Claude, Claude, when every bird in forest and field knows the call of its mate, can you not guess the meaning of those strings? Must she open those sealed lips and call your very name? She who would rather die than call it? He does not understand, yet without understanding he answers, he rises from his seat, he moves to the window, he will not tiptoe or peep, he will be bold and bad. Brazenly he lifts the curtain and looks down, and one, one only, not the artist and not the patroness of art, but that one who would not lift her eyes to that window for all the world's wealth, knows he is standing there, listening and looking down. He counts himself all unseen, yet presently shame drops the curtain. He turns away, yet stands hearkening. The music is about to end. The last note trembles on the air. There is silence. Then someone moves from a chair, and the single cry of admiration and delight from the player's companion is the player's name, Marguerite Beausoleil. Hours afterward there sat Claude in the seat where he had sunk down when he heard that name. The artist's visitors had made a long stay, but at length they were gone, and now Claude too rose to go out. His steps were heard below, and presently the painter's voice called persuadingly up, "'Saint-Pierre, Saint-Pierre, come see!' 
They stood side by side before the new work. Claude gazed in silence. At length he said, still gazing, I'll buy it when tis finish. But the artist explained again that it was being painted for Marguerite's friend. For what she wanted, demanded Claude. The Spaniard smiled and intimated that the lady probably thought he could paint. But at any rate, he went on to say, she seemed to have a hearty affection for the girl herself, whom, he said, she had described as being as good as she looked. Claude turned and went slowly out. When at sunset he stood under the honey locust tree on the levee where he was wont to find his father waiting for him, he found himself alone. But within speaking distance he saw St. Pierre's skiff just being drawn ashore by a ragged negro, who presently turned and came to him, half lifting the wretched hat that slouched about his dark brows and smiling. Sim like you done forgot me, he said. Don't you member how I used live at Belle Alliance? Yes, sir. I's de one what show Bonaventure de road to Grand Point. Yes, sir. But I done left there since Mr. Wallace sold de place. Yes, sir. And when I meet up with you, Papa, you never see a nigger so glad like I was. No, sir. And likewise you, Papa. Yes, sir. And he asks me as I want to work for him, and I see he needin' help, and so I turn in and help him. Oh, yes, sir, das more'n a week now since I've been working for your papa. They got into the skiff and pushed off, the negro alone at the oars. Powerful strong current on utter side, he said, pulling quietly upstream to offset the loss of way he must make presently in crossing the rapid flood. Mr. Claude, I see a gentleman dis day noon what I ain't see before since bout six year and more. I disremember his name, but— Tarbox? asked Claude with sudden interest. Yes, sir, das it, Tarbox. Sim like any man ought to member dat name. Him and you, Papa, done gone down de canal. Yes, sir, in a pirogue. He come in a big hurry and say how dey got a big crevasse up de river on dat side, and he want make you Papa see one man what livin on Lake Catuache. Yes, sir, and you, Papa, say you find your supper in de pot. And Mr. Tarbox, he say he want you take one horse and ride up till de crevasse, and you find one friend of yours yonder, one engineer, and he say, Mr. Tarbox, how he low to meet up with you at your Papa house tomorrow daylight. Yes, sir, Mr. Tarbox. Yes, sir. End of Part 3, Chapter 14 Part 3, Chapter 15. Can They Close the Break? The towering cypresses of the far southern swamps have a great width of base, from which they narrow so rapidly in the first seven or eight feet of their height, and thence upward taper so gradually, that it is almost or quite impossible for an axe-man, standing at their roots, to chop through the great flare that he finds abreast of him and bring the trees down. But when the swamps are deep in water, the swamper may paddle up to these trees, whose narrowed waists are now within the swing of his axe, and standing up in his canoe, by a marvel of balancing skill, cut and cut, until at length his watchful up-glancing eye sees the forest giant bow his head. Then a shove, a few backward sweeps of the paddle, and the canoe glides aside and the great trunk falls, smiting the smooth surface of the water with a roar that miles away reaches the ear like the thunder of artillery. The tree falls, but if the woodsman has not known how to judge and choose wisely when the inner wood is laid bare under the first big chip that flies, there are many chances that the fallen tree will instantly sink to the bottom of the water, and cannot be rafted out. One must know his craft even in Louisiana swamps. Knowledge is power. When Zosephine and Mr. Tarbox finished out that Sunday twilight walk, they talked, after leaving the stile behind, only on business. 
He told her of having lately been with a certain expert in the swamps of Barataria, where he had seen some noble cypress forests tantalizingly near to navigation and market, but practically a great way off, because the levees of the great sugar estates on the Mississippi River shut out all deep overflows. Hence these forests could be bought for seemingly a mere tithe of their value. Now he proposed to buy such a stretch of them along the edge of the shaking prairie north of Lake Catuache, as would show on his part, he said, caution but not temerity. He invited her to participate. And why? For the simple reason that the expert and engineer had dropped the remark that, in his opinion, a certain levy could not possibly hold out against the high water of more than two or three more years, and that when it should break it would spread from three to nine feet of water over hundreds of square miles of swamp forests, prairie tremblant, and rice and sugar fields, and many leagues of railway. Zosephine had consented, and though Mr. Tarbox had soon after gone upon his commercial travels, he had effected the purchase by correspondence, little thinking that the first news he should hear on returning to New Orleans would be that the remotely anticipated break had just occurred. And now, could and would the breach be closed, or must all Barataria soon be turned into and remain for months, a navigable yellow sea. This, Claude knew, was what he must hasten to the crevasse to discover, and return as promptly to report upon, let his heart-strings draw as they might towards the studio in Carondelet Street and the Christian Women's Exchange. End of Part 3, Chapter 15「Part three, Chapter sixteen of Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part three, Chapter sixteen The Outlaw and the Flood. What suffering it costs to be a coward! Some days before the crevasse occurred, he whom we know as the pot-hunter stood again on the platform of that same little railway station whence we once saw him vanish at the sight of Bonaventure des Champs. He had never ventured there since, until now. But there was a new station agent. His Indian squaw was dead. A rattlesnake had given her its fatal sting, and the outcast, dreading all men and the coroner not the least, had, silently and alone, buried her on the prairie. The train rolled up to the station again as before. Claude's friend, the surveyor, stepped off with a cigar in his mouth to enjoy in the train's momentary stay the delightful air that came across the open prairie. The pot-hunter who had got rid of his game ventured near his former patron. It might be the engineer could give him work whereby to earn a day's ready money. He was not disappointed. The engineer told him to come in a day or two, by the waterways the pot-hunter knew so well, across the swamps and prairies to Bayou Terban and the little courthouse town of Homa. And then he added, I heard this morning that somebody had been buying the swamp land all around you out on Lake Catuache. Is it so? The Acadian looked vacant and shook his head. Yes, said the other, a Madame Beausoleil or some, but what's the matter? All aboard, cried the train conductor. The fellow turned pale, said the surveyor, as he resumed his seat in the smoking car, and the landscape began again to whirl by. The pot-hunter stood for a moment, and then slowly, as if he stole away from some sleeping enemy, left the place. Alarm went with him like an attendant ghost. A thousand times that day, in the dark swamp, 
on the wide prairie or under his rush thatch on the lakeside, he tortured himself with one question. Why had she, Zosephine, reached a way out from Carancro to buy the uncultivable and primeval wilderness round about his lonely hiding place? Hour after hour, the inexplicable problem seemed to draw near and nearer to him, a widening, tightening, dreamlike terror that, as it came, silently pointed its finger of death at him. He was glad enough to leave his cabin next day in his small, swift pirogue, shotgun, axe, and rifle his only companions, for Terban. It chanced to be noon of the day following, when he glided up the sunny Terbun towards the parish seat. The shores of the stream have many beauties, but the Acadians' eyes were alert to anything but them. The deep green, waxen-leaved casino hedges, the hedges of Cherokee rose, and sometimes of rose and casino mingled, the fields of corn and sugar cane, the quaint, railed, floating bridges lying across the lazy bayou, the orange groves of aged, giant trees, their dark green boughs grown all to a tangle with well-nigh the density of a hedge, and their venerable trunks hairy with green-gray lichens, the orange trees again in the dooryards with neat pirogues set upon racks under their deep shade, the indescribable floods of sunlight and caverns of shadow, the clear brown depths beneath his canoe, or at the bottom the dark waving green-brown tresses of water-weeds, these were naught to him. But the human presence was much, and once when just ahead of him he espied a young sun-bonneted woman crouching in the pouring sunshine beyond the sod of the bayou's bank, itself but a few inches above the level of the stream, on a little pier of one plank pushed out among the flags and reeds, pounding her washing with a wooden paddle, he stopped the dip of his canoe paddle and gazed with growing trepidation and slackening speed. At the outer end of the plank, the habitual dip of the bucket had driven aside the water-lilies and made a round glassy space that reflected all but perfectly to him her busy young downcast visage. How like! Just then she lifted her head. He started as though his boat had struck a snag. How like, how terribly like to that young Zosephine whose ill-concealed scorn he had so often felt in days, in years, long gone, at Carancro. This was not, and could not be the same, lacked half the necessary years, and yet, in the joy of his relief, he answered her bow with a question, whose was yonder house? She replied in the same Acadian French in which she was questioned, that there dwelt, or had dwelt, and about two weeks ago had died, Monsieur Robichaud. The pot-hunter's paddle dipped again, his canoe shot on, and two hours later he walked with dust-covered feet into Homa. The principal tavern there stands on that corner of the courthouse square to which the swamper would naturally come first. Here he was to find the engineer. But, as with slow, diffident step he set one foot upon the corner of the threshold, there passed quickly by him and out towards the courthouse two persons, one a man of a county courtroom look and with a handful of documents, and the other a woman whom he knew at a glance. Her skirt swept his ankles as he shrank in sudden and abject terror against the wall, yet she did not see him. He turned and retreated the way he had come, nothing doubting that only by the virtue of a voodoo charm which he carried in his pocket he had escaped, for the time being, a plot laid for his capture. For the small, neatly robed form that you may still see disappearing within the courthouse door, beside the limping figure of the probate clerk, is Zosephine Beausoleil. 
She will finish the last pressing matter of the Robichaux succession now in an hour or so, and be off on the little branch railway, whose terminus is here, for New Orleans. When the pot-hunter approached Lake Katouache again, he made on foot, under cover of rushes and reeds taller than he, a wide circuit and reconnaissance of his hut. While still a long way off, he saw, lighted by the sunset rays, what he quickly recognized as a canoe drawn half out of the water almost at his door. He warily drew nearer. Presently he stopped, and stood slowly and softly, shifting his footing about on the oozy soil, at a little point of shore only some fifty yards away from his cabin. His eyes, peering from the ambush, descried a man standing by the pirogue and searching with his gaze the wide distances that would soon be hidden in the abrupt fall of the southern night. The pot-hunter knew him, not by name but by face. The day the outlaw saw Bonaventure at the little railway station, this man was with him. The name the pot-hunter did not know was Saint-Pierre. The ambushed man shrank a step backward into his hiding-place. His rifle was in his hand, and he noiselessly cocked it. He had not resolved to shoot, but a rifle is of no use until it is cocked. While he so stood, another man came into view, and to the first one's side. This one, too, he knew, despite the soft hat that had taken the place of the silk one, for this was Tarbox. The Acadian was confirmed in his conviction that the surveyor's invitation for him to come to Homa was part of a plot to entrap him. While he still looked, the two men got into the canoe, and Saint-Pierre paddled swiftly away. The pot-hunter let down the hammer of his gun, shrank away again, turned and hurried through the tangle, regained his canoe, and paddled off. The men's departure from the cabin was, in his belief, a ruse, but he knew how by circuits and shortcuts to follow after them unseen, and this he did until he became convinced that they were fairly in the company canal and gliding up its dark colonnade in the direction whence they had evidently come. Then he returned to his cabin and with rifle cocked and with slow, stealthy step entered it, and in headlong haste began to prepare to leave it for a long hiding out. He knew every spot of land and water for leagues around, as a bear or fox would know the region about his den. He had in mind now a bit of dry ground scarce fifty feet long or wide, deeply hidden in the swamp to the north of this lake. How it had ever happened that this dry spot, lifted two or three feet above the low level around it, had been made, whether by some dumb force of nature or by the hand of men yet more untamable than he, had never crossed his thought. It was beyond measure of more value to him to know, by what he had seen growing on it season after season, that for many a long year no waters had overflowed it. In the lake close to his hut lay moored his small centerboard lugger, and into this he presently threw his few appliances and supplies, spread sail, and skimmed away, with his pirogue towing after. His loaded rifle lay within instant reach. By choice he would not have harmed any living creature that men call it wrong to injure, but to save himself not only from death, but from any risk of death, rightful or wrongful, he would, not through courage, but in the desperation of frantic cowardice, have killed a hundred men one by one. By this time it was night, and when first the lugger, and after it was hidden away the pirogue, had carried him up a slender bayou as near as they could to the point he wished to reach, he had still to drag the loaded pirogue no small distance through the dark, often wet, and almost impenetrable woods. 
he had taken little rest and less sleep in his late journeyings, and when at length he cast himself down before his fire of dead faggots on the raised spot he had chosen, he slept heavily. He felt safe from man's world, at least for the night. Only one thing gave him concern as he lay down. It was the fact that when, with the old woods habit strong on him, he had approached his selected camping-ground, with such wariness of movement as the dragging pirogue would allow, he had got quite in sight of it before a number of deer on it bounded away. He felt an unpleasant wonder to know what their unwilling boldness might signify. He did not awake to replenish his fire until there were only a few live embers shining dimly at his feet. He rose to a sitting posture, and in that same moment there came a confusion of sound, a trampling through bushes, that froze his blood and robbed his open throat of power to cry. The next instant he knew it was but those same deer. But the first intelligent thought brought a new fear. These most timid of creatures had made but a few leaps and stopped. He knew what that meant. As he leaped to his feet the deer started again, and he heard to his horror, where the ground had been dry and caked when he lay down, the plash of their feet in water. Trembling he drew his boots on, made and lighted a torch, and in a moment was dragging his canoe after him in the direction of the lugger. Presently his steps too were plashing. He stooped, waved the torch low across the water's surface, and followed the gleam with his scrutiny. But he did so not for any doubt that he would see, as he did, the yellow flood of the Mississippi. He believed, as he believed his existence, that his pursuers had let the river in upon the swamp, ruin whom they might, to drive him from cover. Presently he stepped into the canoe, cast his torch into the water, took his paddle, and glided unerringly through a darkness and a wild tangle of undergrowth, large and small, where you or I could not have gone ten yards without being lost. He emerged successfully from the forest into the open prairie, and, under a sky whose stars told him it would soon be day, glided on down the little bayou lane, between walls of lofty rushes, upon which he had come in the evening, and presently found the lugger as he had left her, with her light mast down, hidden among the brake canes that masked a little cove. The waters were already in the prairie, as he boarded the little vessel at the stern, a raccoon waddled in noiseless haste over the bow, and splashed into the wet covert of reeds beyond, if only to keep from sharing his quarters with all the refuge-hunting vermin of the noisome wilderness, the one human must move on. He turned the lugger's prow towards the lake, and spread her sails to the faint, cool breeze, but when day broke, the sail was gone. Far and wide lay the pale green leagues of reeds and bulrushes, with only here and there a low willow or two beside some unseen lagoon, or a sinuous band of darker green, where round rushes and myrtle bushes followed the shore of some hidden bayou. The waters of the lake were gleaming and crinkling in tints of lilac and silver stolen from the air, and away to the right, and yet farther to the left, stood the dark phalanxes of cypress woods. Thus had a thousand mornings risen on the scene in sight of the outlaw. Numberless birds fluttered from place to place, snatching their prey, caroling, feeding their young, chattering, croaking, warbling, and swinging on the bended rush. But if you looked again, strange signs of nature's mute anguish began to show. On every log or bit of smaller drift that rain-swollen bayous had ever brought from the forest and thrown upon their banks some wild tenant of the jungle, hare or weasel, cat, otter or raccoon, had taken refuge, 
sometimes alone, but oftener sharing it in common misery and silent truce with deadly foes. For under all that expanse of green beauty, the water, always abundant, was no longer here and there, but everywhere. See yonder reed but a few yards away? What singular dark enlargement of stem is that near its top, that curious spiral growth? Growth? It is a great serpent that has climbed and twined himself there, and is holding on for the life he loves as we love ours. And see, on a reed near by him, another, and a little farther off, another, and another, and another. Where were our eyes until now? The surface of the vast break, as far as one can see such small things, is dotted with like horrid burdens, and somewhere in this wild desolation, in this green prospect of a million deaths waiting in silence alike for harmful and harmless creatures, one man is hiding from all mankind. End of Part 3, Chapter 16「three, chapter seventeen of Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part three, chapter seventeen. Well hidden. Of all the teeming multitudes of the human world, the pot hunter knows not one soul who is on his side, not one whom he dare let see his face or come between him and a hiding place. The water is rising fast. He dare not guess how high it will come, but rise as it may, linger at its height as it may, he will not be driven out. In his belief, a hundred men are ready at every possible point where his foot could overstep the line of this vast inundation to seize him and drag him to the gallows. Ah, the gallows, not being dead, not God's anger, not eternal burnings, but simply facing death. The gallows, the tree above his head, the rope around his neck, the signal about to be spoken, the one wild moment after it. These keep him here. He has taken down sail and mast. The rushes are twelve feet high. They hide him well. With oars, mast, and the like, he has contrived something by which he can look out over their tops. He has powder and shot, coffee, salt, and rice. He will not be driven out. At night he spreads his sail and seeks the open waters of the lake, where he can sleep by littles without being overrun by serpents, but when day breaks there is no visible sign of his presence. Yet he is where he can see his cabin. It is now deep in the water, and the flood is still rising. He is quite sure no one has entered it since he left it. But the strain of perpetual watching... When at dawn of the fifth day he again looked for cover in the prairie, the water was too high to allow him concealment, and he sought the screen of some willows that fringed the edge of the swamp forest, anchoring in a few rods' width of open water between them and the woods. He did not fear to make, on the small hearth of mud and ashes he had improvised in his lugger, the meagre fire needed to prepare his food. Its slender smoke quickly mingled with the hazy vapors and shadows of the swamp. As he cast his eye abroad, he found nowhere any sign of human approach. Here and there the tops of the round rushes still stood three feet above the water, but their slender needles were scarcely noticeable. Far and near, over prairie as over lake, lay the unbroken yellow flood, there was no flutter of wings, no whistle of feathered mate to mate, no call of nestlings from the ruined nests. Except the hawk and vulture, the birds were gone. 
Untold thousands of dumb creatures had clung to life for a time, but now were devoured by birds of prey and by alligators, or were drowned. Thousands still lived on. Behind him in the swamp the wood birds remained, the gray squirrel still barked and leaped from tree to tree, the raccoon came down to fish, the plundering owl still hid himself through the bright hours, and the chilled snake curled close in the warm folds of the hanging moss. Nine feet of water below. In earlier days to the northward through the forest, many old timbers rejected in railway construction or repair, with dead logs and limbs, had been drifted together by heavy rains and had gathered a covering of soil. Cane brake, luxurious willow bushes, and tough grasses had sprung up on them and bound them with their roots. These floating islands, the flood, now covering the dense underbrush of the swamp, lifted on its free surface, and in its slow creep southward bore through the pillared arcades of the cypress wood and out over the submerged prairies. Many a cowering deer in those last few days that had made some one of these green fragments of the drowned land a haven of despair, the human castaway left unharmed. Of all sentient creatures in that deluge he was suffering most, he was gaunt and haggard with watching, the thought of pursuit bursting suddenly around him now fastened permanently upon his imagination. He feared to sleep. From the direction of the open water surprise seemed impossible, but from the forest what instant might it not ring with the hoop of discovery, the many-voiced halting challenge, and the glint of loaded Winchester? And another fear had come, Many a man not a coward, and as used to the sight of serpents as this man, has never been able to be other than a coward concerning them. The pot-hunter held them in terror. It was from fear of them that he had lighted his torch the night of his bivouac in the swamp. Only a knowledge of their ordinary haunts and habits, and the art of avoiding them, had made the swamp and prairie life bearable. Now all was changed. They were driven from their dens. In the forest one dared not stretch forth the hand to lay it upon any tangible thing until a searching glance had failed to find the glittering eye and forked tongue that meant beware. In the flooded prairie the willow trees were loaded with the knotted folds of the moccasin, the rattlesnake, and I know not how many other sorts of deadly or only loathsome serpents. Some little creatures at the bottom of the water, feeding on the soft white part of the round rush near its root, every now and then cut a stem free from its base and let it spring to the surface and float away. Often a snake had wrapped himself about the end above the water, and when this refuge gave way and drifted abroad, he would cling for a time, until some less forlorn hope came in sight, and then swim for it. Thus scarce a minute of the day passed, it seemed, but one, two, or three of these creatures, making for their fellow castaway's boat, were turned away by nervous waving of arms. The knights had proved that they could not climb the lugger's side, and when he was in her the canoe was laid athwart her gunwales, but at night he had to drop the bit of old iron that served for an anchor, and the very first night a large moccasin, not of the dusky kind described in books, but of that yet deadlier black sort, an L in length, which the swampers call the Congo, came up the anchor rope. The castaway killed it with an oar, but after that, who would have slept? About sunset of the fifth day, though it was bright and beautiful, the hunter's cunning detected the first subtle signs of a coming storm. He looked about him to see what provision was needed to meet and weather its onset. On the swamp side, the loftiest cypresses, should the wind bring any of them down, would not more than cast the spray of their fall as far as his anchorage. The mass of willows on the prairie side was nearer, 
but its trees stood low. Already here and there the branches touched the water. The hurricane might tear away some boughs, but could do no more. He shortened the anchor rope and tried the hold of the anchor on the bottom to make sure the lugger might not swing into the willows, for in every fork of every bough was a huge dark mass of serpents plated and piled upon one another, and ready at any moment to glide apart towards any new shelter that might be reached. While eye and hand were thus engaged, the hunter's ear was attentive to sounds that he had been hearing for more than an hour. These were the puff of skate-pipes and plash of a paddle-wheel, evidently from a small steamer in the company canal. She was coming down it, that is, from the direction of the river and the city. Whither was she bound? To some one of the hundred or more plantations and plantation homes that the far-reaching crevasse had desolated? Likely enough. In such event she would not come into view, although for some time now he had seen faint shreds of smoke in the sky over a distant line of woods. But it filled him with inward tremors to know that if she chose to leave the usual haunts of navigation on her left, and steam out over the submerged prairies and the lake, and into the very shadow of these cypresses, she could do it without fear of a snag or a shallow. He watched anxiously as the faint smoke reached a certain point. If the next thin curl should rise farther on, it would mean safety. But when it came, it seemed to be in the same place as the last, and another the same, and yet another the same. She was making almost a straight line for the spot where he stood. Only a small low point of forest broke the line, and presently, far away, she slowly came out from behind it. End of Part 3 Chapter 17Part three, chapter eighteen of Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part three, chapter eighteen, the tornado. The Acadian stooped at once and with a quick splash launched his canoe. A minute later he was in it, gliding along and just within the edge of the forest where it swept around nearly at right angles to the direction in which the steamboat was coming. Thus he could watch the approaching steamer unseen, while every moment putting distance between himself and the lugger. The strange visitor came on. How many men there were on her lower deck? Were they really negroes, or had they blackened their faces, as men sometimes do when they are going to hang a poor devil in the woods? On the upper deck are two others whose faces do not seem to be blackened, but a moment later they are the most fearful sight of all, for only too plainly does the fugitive see that they are the same two men who stood before the doorway of his hut six days before, and see how many canoes on the lower deck. While the steamer is yet half a mile away from the hidden lugger, her lamps and fires and their attendant images in the water beneath glow softly in the fast-deepening twilight, and the night comes swiftly down. The air is motionless. Across the silent waste an engine bell jangles. The puff of steam ceases. The one plashing paddle-wheel at the stern is still. The lights glide more and more slowly. With a great crash and rumble that is answered by the echoing woods, the anchor chain runs out its short measure, and the steamer stops. Gently the pot-hunter's paddle dipped again, and the pirogue moved back towards the lugger. It may be that the flood was at last numbing his fear, as it had so soon done that of all the brute life around him. It was in his mind to do something calling for more courage than he had ever before commanded in his life, save on that one day in Carancro, when, stung to madness by the taunts of a brave man, and driven to the wall, he had grappled and slain his tormentor. 
He had the thought now to return, and under cover of the swamp's deep outer margin of shadow, silently lift into the canoe the bit of iron that anchored the lugger, and as noiselessly draw her miles away to another covert, or, if the storm still held back, even at length to step the mast, spread the sail, and put the horizon between him and the steamer before daybreak. This he had now started to do, and would do, if only courage would hold on and the storm hold off. For a time his canoe moved swiftly, but as he drew near the lugger his speed grew less and less, and eye and ear watched and hearkened with their intensest might. He could hear talking on the steamer. There was a dead calm. He had come to a spot just inside the wood abreast of the lugger. His canoe slowly turned and pointed towards her, and then stood still. He sat there with his paddle in the water, longing like a dumb brute, longing, and without emotion, struggling for courage enough to move forward. It would not come. His heart jarred his frame with its beating. He could not stir. As he looked out upon the sky, a soft, faint tremor of light glimmered for a moment over it, without disturbing a shadow below. The paddle stirred gently, and the canoe slowly drew back. The storm was coming to betray him with its lightnings. In the black forest's edge the pot-hunter lingered trembling. Oh, for the nerve to take a brave man's chances! A little courage would have saved his life. He wiped the dew from his brow with his sleeve, every nerve had let go. Again there came across the water the very words of those who talked together on the steamer. They were saying that the felling of trees would begin in the morning, but they spoke in a tongue which Acadians of late years had learned to understand, though many hated it, but of which he had never known twenty words, and what he had known were now forgotten, the English tongue. Even without courage, to have known a little English would have made the difference between life and death. Another glimmer spread dimly across the sky, and a faint murmur of far-off thunder came to the ear. He turned the pirogue and fled. Soon the stars are hidden. A light breeze seems rather to tremble and hang poised than to blow. The rolling clouds, the dark wilderness, and the watery waste shine out every moment in the wide gleam of lightning still hidden by the wood, and are wrapped again in ever-thickening darkness, over which thunders roll and jar and answer one another across the sky. Then, like a charge of ten thousand lancers, come the wind and the rain, their onset covered by all the artillery of heaven. The lightnings leap, hiss, and blaze, the thunders crack and roar, the rain lashes, the waters writhe, the wind smites and howls. For five, for ten, for twenty minutes, for an hour, for two hours, the sky and the flood are never for an instant wholly dark, or the thunder for one moment silent. But while the universal roar sinks and swells, and the wide, vibrant illumination shows all things in ghostly half-concealment, fresh floods of lightning every moment rend the dim curtain and leap forth. The glare of day falls upon the swaying wood, the reeling, bowing, tossing willows, the seething waters, the whirling rain, and in the midst the small form of the distressed steamer, her revolving paddle-wheels toiling behind to lighten the strain upon her anchor-chains. Then all are dim ghosts again, while a peal, as if the heavens were rent, rolls off around the sky, comes back in shocks and throbs, and sinks in a long roar that before it can die is swallowed up in the next flash and peal. The deserted lugger is riding out the tornado, whirled one moment this way and another that, now and again taking in water, her forest shelter breaks the force of many a gust that would have destroyed her out in the open. 
but in the height of the storm her poor substitute for an anchor lets go its defective hold on the rushy bottom and drags and the little vessel backs backs into the willows she escapes such entanglement as would capsize her and by and by when the wind lulls for a moment and then comes with all its wrath from the opposite direction she swings clear again and drags back nearly to her first mooring and lies there swinging tossing and surviving still a den of snakes the tempest was still fierce though abating and the lightning still flashed but less constantly when at a point near the lugger the pirogue came out of the forest laboring against the wind and half filled with water on the face of the storm-beaten man in it each gleam of the lightning showed the pallid confession of mortal terror where that frail shell had been or how often it had cast its occupant out no one can ever know he was bareheaded and barefooted one cannot swim in boots without them even one who has never dared learn how may hope to swim a little in the darkness he drew alongside the lugger rose balanced skilfully seized his moment and stepped safely across her gunwale a slight lurch caused him to throw his arms out to regain his poise the line by which he still held the canoe straightened out its length and slipped from his grasp in an instant the pirogue was gone a glimmer of lightning showed her driving off sideways before the wind but it revealed another sight also it was dark again black but the outcast stood freezing with horror and fright gazing just in advance of his feet and waiting for the next gleam it came brighter than the last and scarcely a step before him he saw three great serpents moving towards the spot that gave him already such slender footing he recoiled a step another but instantly as he made the second a cold living form was under his foot its folds flew round his ankle and once twice it struck with a frantic effort he spurned it from him all in the same instant a blaze of lightning discovered the maimed form and black and red markings of a bastard horned snake and with one piercing wail of despair that was drowned in the shriek of the wind and roar of the thunder he fell a few hours later the winds were still the stars were out a sweet silence had fallen upon the water and wood and from her deck the watchman on the steamer could see in the northeastern sky a broad soft illumination and knew it was the lights of slumbering new orleans eighteen miles away by and by farther to the east another brightness began to grow and gather this light into its outstretched wings in the nearest wood a soft twitter came from a single tiny bird another voice answered it a different note came from a third quarter there were three or four replies the sky turned to blue and began to flush a mocking-bird flew out of the woods on her earliest quest for family provision a thrush began to sing and in a moment the whole forest was one choir what wonderful purity was in the fragrant air what color was on the calm waters and in the deep sky how beautiful how gentle was nature after her transport of passion shall we ever subdue her and make her always submissive and compliant who knows who knows what man may do with her when once he has got self the universal self under perfect mastery see yonder huge bull alligator swimming hitherward out of the swamp even as you point he turns again in alarm and is gone once he was man's terror leviathan the very lions of africa and the grizzlies of the rockies so they tell us are no longer the bold enemies of man they once were subdue the earth it is being done science and art commerce and exploration are but parts of religion 
Help us, brothers all, with every possible discovery and invention, to complete the conquest begun in that lost garden whence man and woman first came forth, not for vengeance, but for love, to bruise the serpent's head. But as yet, both within us and without us, what terrible revolts doth nature make, what awful victories doth she have over us, and then turn and bless and serve us again. As the sun was rising, one of the timber-cutters from the steamer stood up in his canoe about half a mile away, near the wood and beside some willows, and hallowed and beckoned. And when those on the steamer hearkened, he called again, bidding them tell de boss that he had found a canoe adrift, an anchored boat, and a white man in her, dead. Tarbox and St. Pierre came in a skiff. "'Is he drowned?' asked Mr. Tarbox, while still some distance off. "'Been struck by lightning, Simlike,' replied the negro who had found the body. "'Watch out, Mr. Tarbox,' he added, as the skiff drew near. "'Dat boat des lousy with snake.' Tarbox stood up in the skiff and looked sadly upon the dead face. "'It's our man,' he said to St. Pierre. "'Das what I say,' exclaimed the negro. "'Yes, sir, so soon I see him, I say, "'Most surely das de same man what Mr. Tarbox looking for "'to show him round bout de swamp. "'Yes, sir, not in standin' I never see him before. "'No, sir. "'Lord, look yonder. "'Look dat big bastard horn snake. "'He can't get away. "'He's hurt. "'Lord, das what kill dat man. "'Dat man tromp on him in de dark, "'and he struck him with his horny tail.' "'Look at dem four little spot on de man foot. "'Now, Mr. Tallbox, you been talk about dem our bastard horn snake not pison. "'Well, most surely dey bite ain't pison, "'but if dat horn on de end of his tail des only tetch you, you gone. "'Look at dat man. Kill him so quick dey want time for de place to swell while he was hit.' But Tarbox quietly pointed out to St. Pierre that the tiny wounds were made by the reptile's teeth. "'The coroner's verdict will probably be privation and exposure,' said he softly, "'but it ought to be killed by fright and the bite of a harmless snake.' "'On his murmured suggestion, St. Pierre gave orders that, with one exception, "'every woodsman go to his tree-felling, "'and that the lugger and canoe, with the dead man lying untouched, be towed by skiff and a single pair of oars to the head of the canal for inquest and burial. "'I'll go with him,' said Tarbox softly to St. Pierre. "'We owe him all we're going to get out of these woods, and I owe him a great deal more.' When a little later he was left for a moment without a hearer, he said to the prostrate form, "'Poor fellow!' and to think i had her message to you to come out of this swamp and begin to live the life of a live man the rude funeral moved away and soon the woods were ringing with the blow of axes and the shout and song of black timbermen as gaily as though there had never been or was to be a storm or a death end of part three chapter eighteen Part three, chapter nineteen of Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part three, chapter nineteen. Tears and such things. Marguerite and her friend had no sooner taken their seats to drive home from the studio the day the sketch was made. Then Marguerite began a perfect prattle. Her eyes still shone excitedly, and leaped and fell and darkened and brightened with more than the swift variety of a fountain in the moonlight, while she kept trying in vain to meet her companion's looks with a moment's steady regard. Claude was found, and she trembled with delight. But alas, he had heard her passionate call and yet stood still, had looked down upon her in silence, and drawn again the curtain between them. 
She had thought until the last moment, he will come, he will confront us as we pass out the door, will overtake us at the foot of the stairs, on the sidewalk, at the carriage window. But it had not been so, and now they were gone from the place, and here sat this friend, this gay, cynical knower of men's and women's ways, answering her chatter in short, smiling responses, with a steady eye fixed on her, and reading, Marguerite believed, as plainly as if it were any of the signboards along the rattling street, the writing of her fluttering heart. And so, even while she trembled with strange delight, pain, shame, and alarm, pleaded through her dancing glances, now by turns and now in confusion together, for mercy and concealment. But in fact, as this friend sat glancing upon the young face beside her with secret sympathy and admiration, it was only this wild fear of betrayal that at length betrayed. Reaching the house, the street door was hardly shut behind them when Marguerite would have darted up to her chamber, but her friend caught her hands across the balustrade and said with roguery in her own eyes, "'Marguerite, you sweet rowdy!' "'What?' "'Yes, what? There's something up. What is it?' The girl tried to put on surprise, but her eyes failed her again. She leaned on the rail and looked down, meanwhile trying softly to draw away upstairs, but her friend held on to one hand and murmured, "'Just one question, dearie, just one. I'll not ask another. I'll die first. You'll probably find me inarticulo mortis when you come downstairs.' "'Just one question, lovey.' "'What is it?' "'It's nothing but this. I ask for information.' The voice dropped to a whisper. "'Is he as handsome as his portrait?' The victim rallied all her poor powers of face and turned feebly upon the questioner. "'Portrait? Who?' Her voice was low, and she glanced furtively at the nearest door. "'I don't understand you.' Her hand pulled softly for its freedom, and she turned to go, repeating with averted face, "'I don't understand you tall.' "'Well, never mind, then, dear, if you don't understand,' responded the tease with mock tenderness. "'But, ma belle créole, je suis acadienne. You're an angel faintly disguised. Only look around here.' Only, Angelica, don't try to practice a woman's humbug on a woman, at least not on this old one. It doesn't work. I'll tell you whom I mean. She pulled, but Margaret held off. I mean, she hoarsely whispered, I mean the young inventor that engineer told us about, remember? Marguerite, with her head bowed low, slowly dragged her hand free and moved with growing speed up the stairs, saying, "'I don't know what is dat. I don't understand you tall.' Her last words trembled as if nigh to tears. At the top of the stairs, the searching murmur of her friend's voice came up, and she turned and looked back. "'Forgive me,' said the figure below. The girl stood a moment, sending down a reassuring smile. "'You young rogue,' murmured the lady, looking up with ravished eyes. Then she lifted herself on tiptoe, made a trumpet of both little hands, and whispered, "'Don't worry, we'll bring it out all right.' Whereat Marguerite blushed from temple to throat and vanished. The same day word came from her mother of her return from Terbonne, and she hastened to rejoin her in their snug rooms over the women's exchange. When she snatched Zosephine into her arms and shed tears, the mother merely wiped and kissed them away, and asked no explanation. The two were soon apart, for Marguerite hungered unceasingly for solitude. Only in solitude could she, or dared she, give herself up to the constant recapitulation of every minutest incident of the morning. And that was ample employment. They seemed the happenings of a month ago. She felt as if it were imperative to fix them in her memory now, or lose them in confusion and oblivion forever. 
Over them all again and again she went, sometimes quickening memory with half-spoken words, sometimes halting in long reverie at some intense juncture, now with tingling pleasure at the unveiling of the portrait, the painter's cautionary revelation of the personal presence above, or Claude's appearance at the window, now with burnings of self-abasement at the passionate but ineffectual beseechings of her violin, and always ending with her face in her hands as though to hide her face even from herself, for shame that all her calling, her bare-faced as it seemed to her, her abject calling, he had not come. Marguerite, my child, it is time for bed. She obeyed. It was all one, the bed or the window. Her mother, weary with travel, fell asleep. But she, she heard the clock downstairs strike, and a clock next door attest, twelve, one, two, three, four. And another day began to shine in at the window. As it brightened, her spirits rose. She had been lying long in reverie. Now she began once more the oft-repeated rehearsal. But the new day shone into it also. When the silent recital again reached its end, the old distress was no longer there, but in its place was a new, sweet shame, near of kin to joy. The face, unhidden, looked straight into the growing light. Whatever else had happened, this remained, that Claude was found. She silently formed the name on her parted lips. Claude, 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 and could not stop, though it gave her pain. The pain was so sweet. She ceased only when there rose before her again the picture of him drawing the curtain and disappearing. But even then she remembered the words, don't worry, we'll bring it out all right, and smiled. When Zosephine, as the first sunbeam struck the window pane, turned upon her elbow and looked into the fair face beside her, the eyes were closed in sleep. She arose, darkened the room, and left it. End of Part 3, Chapter 19「Part Three, Chapter Twenty of Bonaventure, a Prose Pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a Prose Pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part Three, Chapter Twenty Love, Anger, and Misunderstanding. The city bells had sounded for noon when the sleeper opened her eyes. While she slept, Claude had arrived again at his father's cottage from the scene of the crevasse, and reported to Tarbox the decision of himself and the engineer that the gap would not be closed for months to come. While he told it, they sat down with Saint-Pierre to breakfast. Claude, who had had no chance even to seek sleep, ate like a starved horse. Tarbox watched him closely with hidden and growing amusement. Presently their eyes fastened on each other steadily. Tarbox broke the silence. "'You don't care how the crevasse turns out. I've asked you a question now twice, and you don't even hear.' "'Why don't you ask again?' responded the younger man, reaching over to the meat dish and rubbing his bread in the last of the gravy. Some small care called Saint-Pierre away from the board. Tarbox leaned forward on his elbows, and not knowing he quoted, said softly, "'There's something up. What is it?' "'Up?' asked Claude in his full voice, frowning. "'Up where? What? What is?' "'Ah, yes,' said Tarbox, with affected sadness. "'Yes, that's it. I thought so. Oh, Han for somebody. Oh, hey for somebody.' Claude stopped with a morsel halfway to his mouth, glared at him several seconds, and then resumed his eating, not like a horse now, but like a bad dog gnawing an old bone. He glanced again angrily at the embodiment of irreverence opposite. Mr. Tarbox smiled. 
Claude let slip, not intending it, an audible growl with his eyes in the plate. Mr. Tarbox's smile increased to a noiseless laugh and grew and grew until it took hopeless possession of him. His nerves relaxed. He trembled. The table trembled with him. His eyes filled with tears. His brows lifted laboriously. He covered his lips with one hand, and his abdomen shrank until it pained him. And Claude knew and showed he knew it all. That was what made it impossible to stop. At length, with tottering knees, Mr. Tarbox rose and started silently for the door. He knew Claude's eyes were following. He heard him rise to his feet. He felt as though he would have given a thousand dollars if his legs would but last him through the doorway. But to crown all, St. Pierre met him just on the threshold, breaking, with unintelligent sympathy, into a broad, simple smile. Tarbox laid one hand upon the door for support, and at that moment there was a hurtling sound. Something whizzed by Tarbox's ear, and the meat dish crashed against the doorpost and flew into a hundred pieces. The book agent ran like a deer for a hundred yards and fell groveling upon the turf, the laugh still griping him with the energy of a panther's jaws, while Claude, who in blind pursuit had come threshing into his father's arms, pulled his hat over his eyes and strode away towards the skiff ferry. As Mr. Tarbox returned towards the cottage, St. Pierre met him looking very grave, if not displeased. The swamper spoke first. "'Das mighty good for you I was yonder to stop that boy. He would a half kill you. "'He'd have served me exactly right,' said the other, and laughed again. St. Pierre shook his head as though this confession were poor satisfaction, and said, "'Das not safe, make occasion mad. He don't get mad easy, but when he get mad, it break out all over him, yas. He goin' feel bad all day now. I see tear in his eye when he walk off.' "'I'm sorry,' said Tarbox sincerely, and presently added, now while you look up a picked gang of timbermen, I'll see if I can charter a little stern-wheel steamer, get that written permission from Madame Beausoleil to cut trees on her land, and so forth and so forth. You'll hardly see me before bedtime again. It was the first hour of the afternoon when Claude left his little workroom and walked slowly down to and across Canal Street and into Bourbon. He had spent the intervening hours seated at his work-table with his face in his hands. He was in great bitterness. His late transport of anger gave him no burdensome concern. Indeed, there was consolation in the thought that he should, by and by, stand erect before one who was so largely to blame, and make that full confession and apology which he believed his old-time Grand Point schoolmaster would have offered, could Bonaventure ever have so shamefully forgotten himself. Yet the chagrin of having at once so violently and so impotently belittled himself added one sting more to his fate. He was in despair. An escaped balloon, a burst bubble, could hardly have seemed more utterly beyond his reach now than did Marguerite and he could not blame her. She was right, he said sternly to himself, right to treat his portrait as something that reminded her of nothing, whether it did so or not, to play on with undisturbed inspiration, to lift never a glance to his window, and to go away without a word, a look, a sign to any one, when the least breath or motion would have brought him instantly into her sacred presence. She was right. She was not for him. There is a fitness of things, and there was no fitness, he said, of him for her. And yet she must and would ever be more to him than any one else. He would glory in going through life unloved, while his soul lived in and on the phantom companionship of that vision of delight which she was and should ever be. The midday bells sounded softly here and there. He would walk. As I say, he went slowly down the old Rue Bourbon. 
He had no hunger. He would pass by the women's exchange. There was nothing to stop there for. Was not Madame Beausoleil in Terrebonne, and Marguerite the guest of that chattering woman in silk and laces? But when he reached the exchange doors, he drifted in as silently and supinely as any drift log would float into the new crevasse. The same cashier was still on duty. She lighted up joyously as he entered, and, when he had hung his hat near the door, leaned forward to address him, but with a faint pain in his face and loathing in his heart, he passed on and out into the veranda. The place was well filled, and he had to look about to find a seat. The bare possibility that she might be there was overpowering. There was a total suspension of every sort of emotion. He felt, as he took his chair and essayed to glance casually around, as light and unreal as anyone who ever walked the tightrope in a dream. The blood leaped in torrents through his veins, and yet his movements, as he fumbled aimlessly with his knife, fork, and glass, were slow and languid. A slender young waitress came, rested her knuckles on the table and leaned on them, let her opposite arm hang limply along the sideways curve of her form, and bending a smile of angelic affection upon the young Acadian, said in a confidential undertone, "'The cashier told me to tell you those ladies have come.' Claude rose quickly and stood looking down upon the face before him, speechless. It was to him exactly as if a man in uniform had laid a hand upon his shoulder and said, "'You're my prisoner.' Then, still gazing and aware of others looking at him, he slowly sank again into his seat. "'She just told me to tell you,' said the damsel. "'Yes, sir. Have you ordered?' Hmph. He was still looking at her. I say, have you given your order? Yes. She paused awkwardly, for she knew he had not, and saw that he was trying vainly to make her words mean something in his mind. Shan't I get you some coffee and rolls, same as day before yesterday? Yes. He did not know what she said. His heart had stopped beating. Now it began again at a gallop. He turned red. He could see the handkerchief that was wadded into his outer breast pocket jar in time with the heavy thump, thump, thump beneath it. The waitress stayed an awful time. At last she came. I waited, she sweetly said, to get hot ones. He drew the refreshments towards him mechanically. The mere smell of food made him sick. It seemed impossible that he should eat it. She leaned over him lovingly and asked, as if referring to the attitude, "'Would you like anything more? Something sweet?' His flesh crawled. He bent over his plate, shook his head, and stirred his coffee without having put anything into it. She tripped away, and he drew a breath of momentary relief, leaned back in his chair, and warily passed his eyes around to see if there was anybody who was not looking at him and waiting for him to begin to eat. Ages afterward, to speak with Claude's feelings, he rose, took up his check, and went to the desk. The cashier leaned forward and said with soft blitheness, "'They're here. They're upstairs now.' Claude answered never a word. He paid his check." As he waited for change, he cast another glance over the various groups at the tables. All were strangers. Then he went out. On the single sidewalk step he halted, and, red and blind with mortification, turned again into the place. He had left his hat. With one magnificent effort at dignity and unconcern, he went to the rack, took down the hat, and as he lowered it towards his head, cast a last look down the room, and there stood Marguerite. She had entered, just in time it seemed to him, but just too late, in fact, to see and understand the blunder. Oh, agony! They bowed to each other with majestic faintness, and then each from each was gone. 
The girl at the desk saw it and was dumb. End of Part 3, Chapter 20「Part three, Chapter twenty one of Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part three, Chapter twenty one Love and Luck by Electric Light. Mr. Tarbox was really a very brave man, for had he not been, how could he have ventured, something after the middle of that afternoon, in his best attire, up into Claude's workroom? He came to apologize, but Claude was not there. He waited, but the young man did not return. The air was hot and still. Mr. Tarbox looked at his watch. It was a quarter of five. He rose and descended to the street, looked up and down it, and then moved briskly down to and across Canal Street and into Bourbon. He had an appointment. Claude had not gone back to his loft at all. He was wandering up and down the streets. About four he was in Bienville Street, where the pleasure trains run through it on their way out to Spanish Fort, a beautiful pleasure ground some six miles away from the city's center, on the margin of Lake Pontchartrain. He was listlessly crossing the way as a train came along, and it was easy for the habit of the aforetime brakeman to move him. As the last platform passed the crossing, he reached out mechanically and swung aboard. Spanish Fort is at the mouth of Bayou St. John. A drawbridge spans the bayou. On the farther, the eastern side, Claude stood leaning against a pile, looking off far beyond West End to where the sun was setting in the swamps about Lake Maurepas. There, there, not seen save by memory's eye, yet there not the less, was Bayou des Acadiennes. Ah, me! There was Grand Point. Oh, Bonaventure, do I owe you, Claude's thought was in the old Acadian tongue, do I owe you malice for this? No, 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 better this than less. And then he recalled a writing book copy that Bonaventure had set for him of the schoolmaster's own devising. Better great sorrow than small delight. His throat tightened, and his eyes swam. A pretty schooner with green hull and new sails came down the bayou. As he turned to gaze on her, the bridge, just beyond his feet, began to swing open. He stepped upon it and moved towards its center, his eyes still on the beautiful, silent advance of the vessel. With a number of persons who had gathered from both ends of the bridge, he paused and leaned over the rail as the schooner, with her crew looking up into the faces of the throng, glided close by. A female form came beside him, looking down with the rest and shedding upon the air the soft sweetness of perfumed robes. A masculine voice just beyond said, a thing of beauty is a joy for ever. Claude started and looked up, and behold, Marguerite on the arm of Tarbox. His movement drew their glance, and the next instant Mr. Tarbox, beaming apology and pouring out glad greetings, had him by the hand. Burning, choking, stammering, Claude heard and answered, he knew not how, the voice of the queen of all her kind. Another pair pressed forward to add their salutations. They were Zosephine and the surveyor. Because the facilities for entertaining a male visitor were slender at the women's exchange, because there was hope of more and cooler air at the lakeside, because Spanish Fort was a pretty and romantic spot and not so apt to be thronged as West End, and because Marguerite, as she described it, was tired of houses and streets, and also because he had something to say to Zosephine, Mr. Tarbox had brought the pretty mother and daughter out here. 
The engineer had met the three by chance only a few minutes before, and now, as the bridge closed again, he passed Zosephine over to Claude, walked only a little way with them down a path among the shrubbery, and then lifted his hat and withdrew. For once in his life, Mr. G. W. Tarbox, as he walked with Marguerite in advance of Claude and her mother, was at a loss what to say. The drollness of the situation was in danger of overcoming him again. Behind him was Claude, his mind tossed on a wild sea of doubts and suspicions. "'I told him,' thought Tarbox, while the girl on his arm talked on in pretty broken English and sprightly haste about something he had lost the drift of, I told him I was courting Josephine, but I never proved it to him. And now just look at this. Look at the whole sweet mess. Something has got to be done. He did not mean something direct and open-handed. That would never have occurred to him. He stopped and, with Marguerite, faced the other pair. One glance into Claude's face, darkened with perplexity, anger, and a distressful effort to look amiable and comfortable, was one too many. Tarbox burst into a laugh. "'Pardon,' he exclaimed, checking himself until he was read. "'I just happened to think of something very funny that happened last week in Arkansas. "'Madame Beausoleil, I know it must look odd,' His voice still trembled a little, but he kept a sober face. And yet I must take just a moment for business. Claude, can I see you? They went a step aside. Mr. Tarbox put on a business frown and said to Claude in a low voice, Hi diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon, the little dog laughed to see the sport, and the dish ran away with the spoon, you understand, I'm simply talking for talk's sake, as we resume our walk we'll inadvertently change partners, a kind of women's exchange, as it were, old Mother Hubbard, she went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone, but when she got there the cupboard, don't smile so broadly, was bare, and so the poor dog had none, will that be sad? satisfactory? Claude nodded, and as they turned again to their companions, the exchange was made with the grace, silence, and calm unconsciousness of pure oversight, or of general complicity. Very soon it suited Zosephine and Tarbox to sit down upon a little bench beside a bed of heart's ease, and listen to the orchestra, but Marguerite preferred to walk in and out among the leafy shadows of the electric lamps. And so side by side, as he had once seen Bonaventure and Sidonie go, they went, Claude and Marguerite, away from all windings of disappointment, all shadows of doubt, all shoals of misapprehension, out upon the open sea of mutual love. Not that the great word of words, affirmative or interrogative, was spoken then and there. They came no nearer to it than this. I wish, murmured Claude, they had gone over all the delicious, and I thought that yous, and the sweetly reproachful, did you think that eyes, and had covered the past down to the meeting on the bridge. I wish, he murmured, dropping into the old Acadian French, which he had never spoken to her before. "'I wish—' "'What?' she replied softly and in the same tongue. "'I wish,' he responded, "'that this path might never end.' He wondered at his courage, and feared that now he had ruined all, for she made no answer. But when he looked down upon her, she looked up and smiled. A little further on she dropped her fan. He stooped and picked it up, and in restoring it, somehow their hands touched, touched and lingered, and then, and then, through one brief unspeakable moment, a maiden's hand, for the first time in his life, lay willingly in his. Then, as glad as she was frightened, Marguerite said she must go back to her mother, and they went. End of Part 3, Chapter 21
Part three, chapter twenty two of Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable. Part three, chapter twenty two. A double love knot. Spanish Fort, West End, they're well enough, but if I might have one small part of New Orleans to take with me wherever I may wander in this earthly pilgrimage, I should ask for the old Carrollton Gardens. They lie near the farthest upper limit of the expanded city. I should want, of course, to include the levee, under which runs one side of the garden's fence. Also the opposite shore of the Mississippi, with its just discernible plantation houses behind their levee, and the great bend of the river itself, with the sun setting in unutterable gorgeousness behind the distant, low-lying pecan groves of Nine Mile Point, and the bronzed and purpled waters kissing the very crown of the great turfed levee, down under whose land side the gardens blossom and give forth their hundred perfumes and bird songs to the children and lovers that haunt their winding alleys of oleander, jasmine, laurestine, orange, aloe, and rose, the grove of magnolia and oaks, and come out upon the levee's top as the sun sinks to catch the gentle breeze and see the twilight change to moonlight on the water one evening as i sat on one of the levee benches here with one whose i am and who is mine beside me we noticed on the water opposite us and near the farther shore a large skiff propelled with two pairs of oars and containing, besides the two rowers, half a dozen passengers. Then I remembered that I had seen the same craft when it was farther down the stream. The river is of a typical character about here. Coming around the upper bend, the vast current sweeps across to this, the Carrollton side, and strikes it just above the gardens with its incalculable gnawing, tearing power. Hence the very high levee here, the farther back the levee builders are driven by the corroding waters, the lower the ground is under them, and the higher they must build to reach the height they reached before. From Carrollton the current rebounds, and swinging over to the other shore strikes it, boiling like a witch's cauldron, just above and along the place where you may descry the levee lock of the company canal. I knew the waters all about there, and knew that this skiff full of passengers, some of whom we could see were women, having toiled through the seething current below, was now in a broad eddy, and, if it was about to cross the stream, would do so only after it had gone some hundred yards farther up the river. There it could cross almost with the current. And so it did. I had forgotten it again, when presently it showed itself, with all its freight, silhouetted against the crimson sky. I said quickly, I believe Bonaventure Deschamps is in that boat. I was right. The skiff landed, and we saw its passengers step ashore. They came along the levee's crown towards us, by two by two. Bonaventure was mated with a young Methodist preacher who had been my playmate in boyhood and who lived here in Carrollton. Behind him came St. Pierre and Sidney, then followed Claude and Marguerite, and behind all, Zosephine and Tarbox. They had come, they explained to us, from a funeral at the head of the canal. They did not say the funeral of a friend, and yet I could see that every one of them, even the preacher, had shed tears. The others had thought it best and pleasantest to accompany the minister thus far towards his home, then take a turn in the gardens, and then take the horse-cars for the city center. Bonaventure and Sidney were to return next day by steamer to Belle Alliance and Grand Point. The thoughtful Tarbox had procured Bonaventure's presence at the inquest of the day before as the identifying witness, thus to save Zosephine that painful office. 
and yet it was of Zosephine's own motion, and by her sad insistence, that she and her daughter followed the outcast to his grave. Yes, she had said, laying one hand in Bonaventure's and the other in Sidonie's, and speaking in the old Acadian tongue, when I was young and proud, I taught Tanaz to despise and tease him. I did not know then that I was such a coward myself. If I had been a better scholar, Bonaventure, when we used to go to school to the curé together, a better learner, not in the books merely, but in those things that are so much better than the things books teach, how different all might have been. Thank God, Bonaventure, one of us was. She turned to Sidonie to add, but that one was Bonaventure. We will all go to the funeral. We will all go and bury vain regrets with the dead. The influence of the sad office they had just performed was on the group still, as they paused to give us the words of greeting we coveted. Yet we could see that a certain sense of being very, very rich in happiness was on them all, though differently on every one. Zosephine wore the pear-shaped pearl. The preacher said good day and started down the steps that used to lead from the levee down across a pretty fountained court and into the town. But my friend Tarbox, for I must tell you I like to call him my friend and like it better every day, we can't all be one sort. You'd like him if you knew him as I do. My friend Tarbox beckoned me to detain him. Christian, I called. That is the preacher's real name. He turned back and met Tarbox just where I stood. They laid their arms across each other's shoulders in a very Methodist way, and I heard Tarbox say, I want to thank you once more. We've put you to a good deal of trouble. You gave us the best you had. I'll never forget what you said about them who through fear of death are all their lifetime subject to bondage. I wish you were a Catholic priest. Why? So we could pay you for your trouble. I don't think you ought to take it hard if you get a check in tomorrow's mail. Thy money survive with thee, said the preacher. Is that all you want me to be a priest for? Isn't there another reason? His eyes twinkled. Isn't there something else I could do for you, you or Claude, if I should turn priest? Yes, said Tarbox, with grave lips but merry eyes. We've both got to have one. In fact, they had two. Yet I have it from her husband himself that Madame Tarbox insists to this day, always with the same sweet dignity, that she never did say yes. On the other hand, when Claude and Marguerite were kneeling at the altar, the proud St. Pierre senior spoke an audible and joyously impatient affirmative every time either of them was asked a question. When the time came for kissing, Sidonie, turning from both brides, kissed St. Pierre the more for that she kissed not Claude, then turned again and gave a tear with the kiss she gave to Zosephine. But the deepest, gladdest tears at those nuptials were shed by Bonaventure Deschamps. End of Part Three, Chapter Twenty Two. End of Bonaventure, a prose pastoral of Acadian Louisiana by George W. Cable.